And we are live just about two minutes early today, but that's fine. That'll give people time to wander in as we do our intro segment. I'm going to have Steven Reisner back on with us again today. I had him on just a few weeks ago. He's got so much to talk about. I mean, I could probably do a show a month with the guy and never run out of stuff. He's one of the smartest people I know in the worlds of aquaponics, natural farming, and cannabis farming, all three of those things. Uh, Nick Ferguson and I sat on a... Uh, a discussion panel with him at my last workshop. And when we were done, Nick and I looked at each other and said, do you feel a little dumber now? Because this guy's like up here and we're here. And we both agreed with that. So he is a guy that you definitely don't want to miss. And we will have him on in just a minute. Uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and hear from our sponsors of the day. Sponsor today, number one today is Jeff, the Berkey Guy Gleason at USA Berkey Filters. Dot com. You know, we're going to talk a lot about water and water quality today, probably, but we're not talking about the water you drink. You probably could in a well-run aquaponics system, but I, I don't really advise it. Um, I advise you to drink the cleanest, best water you can, and a lot of the water sources that are out there today are just not water I would want to be drinking. And I want you to think about this. You get a boil water advisory from your water company. Do you know why that usually happens? Every once in a while, they catch something right when it does. But usually it's like after enough people show up at the hospital sick and they finally figure it out and you've been drinking it for a week, then they tell you to boil your... How about you just filter your water and stop worrying about it? How about you get a very affordable system that will last a lifetime, one with no moving parts that literally cannot fail as long as you install the filters properly, which is not hard to do. They even tell you how to test that. And if you're going to get a Berkey water filtration system... Get it from the Berkey guy. Don't get it from some guy at a gun show that started selling them yesterday because uh, that's what a lot of people end up doing. And then when you need service and support and all, it's just not there because Berkey has great dealers and they kind of refer that stuff to the dealers, not direct. Anyway, moving on. How about the Wealth Studying Podcast with John Pugliano? Uh, I really recommend you guys check out the episode that he just dropped two days ago, Behold, Wars and Rumors of Wars. Why are investors in Wall Street ignoring clear and present danger of geopolitical instability and escalation of war? I'll tell you why. I don't know what John's going to say about it because I haven't listened to it yet. I just discovered it today and I need to listen to it. But probably because they don't care about escalation and you know geopolitical instability. They think war is good for business. And are they right or wrong? Ah, I'll leave John to explain that to you. But you definitely want to subscribe to the Wealth Studying Podcast. John Pogliano is a great dude. He's also an investment manager. I fully trust the guy 100% because he's one of us, man. John has been around our community for like, let's see, uh, 13 years. 13 years he's been working with us since I met him in Salt Lake City uh, at a prepper convention. Yes, he's an investment manager. He's also a gardener, a homesteader, a prepper, a ham radio operator. He's the kind of guy that you want to work with and you want to hear from. So get on his email list and subscribe to his podcast. And remember, it took me a while. It really did. I mean, he's a boomer. I mean, we love him, but he's a boomer. And it took a long time to get him to set up value for value, like on Fountain or Breeze or whatever. So if you use value for value, you listen to John. Throw him some sats once in a while, just a little bit of lightning sats, you know. That'll help him out and help turn that boomer into a Bitcoin boomer the way that he really should be. Uh, I was going to say, I really, I can't, I have some inside information about that that I just don't feel comfortable releasing. We'll let it go there. With that, let's bring our special guest onto the show, Mr. Stephen Reisner. Stephen, welcome back to the Survival Podcast, man. Hey there. Well, thanks for having me back. I'm happy to be back and... Uh... Happen to be talking on more uh, more garden science. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really meant what I said. Like Nick Ferguson, I really did say after that panel, like, damn, dude's like here, you know. <laughs> uh, you just you have been doing this so long. You've just amassed such a massive amount of knowledge, especially on like the nutrients, natural farming techniques, natural pest control, all of it. It's just amazing. But we're, we're going to mainly focus on the aquaponics side of things today. And I always like to kind of hear people's genesis story. So like if we go back to Stephen Reisner doesn't know much about aquaponics. He's heard the word and he wants to get involved with it. How did you discover it and, and what led you to it? 
Sure. So I originally got involved with aquaponics back when it was, um, we used to call them river tanks uh, for okay. terrariums. Um, they used to sell these river tank insert kits that would allow to have like a, a river that would flow through your uh, aquarium and have different tiers. So you could have like frogs and fish and everything in the same aquarium. And that was my first experience with uh, aquaponics specifically. But at, back in that day, they didn't really call it aquaponics yet. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm not... Uh, uh, you know, it wasn't quite the phrase that was popular. Uh, it wasn't until I went to uh, Colorado and uh, after having the big floods there in um, uh, Colorado that we had the, uh, uh, ended up getting a job at the aquaponics source. And uh, from there I ran their research and development laboratory uh, and then product development, and a whole bunch of other cool things. That's cool. You know, I didn't know that. And I never really thought of it being aquaponics, but I guess that's where I started too. I've always been an aquarium person, a terrarium person or, a reptile and amphibian person. And I used to run tanks with kind of the river recirculating and then you're, you're growing some plants in there with that. And that really is a form of aquaponics. That's, that's cool to know. Um, but that's probably not what people tuning in are, are looking to learn about today, like how to keep a lizard or a poison dart frog happy. So let's move on from there to what about the basic system setups for aquaponics that are more what people think of so that they can grow, you know, plants, whether they're food plants or, I mean, I know a guy that actually grows uh, for profit um, plants like pitcher plants and stuff like that for resale. And he uses aquaponics to propagate them. So can we kind of talk about the different setups for growing plants and fish? Sure. So in aquaponics, um, you really want to cater your system specifically for your types of crops. So if you're doing leafy greens, stuff that's going to grow three months or less, you want to do those in say a raft system because you're going to be able to quick turn them over faster they're going to get better growth uh, and it's really going to help make a big difference in um, uh, growth speed uh, you know you can get head, heads of lettuce in you know eight weeks no pro five to eight weeks no problem depending on the time of year so um, definitely uh, uh, a big benefit for that particular one the downside is is that you can't really supplement them um, you also um, they don't have any support right if i'm growing that outside and i get a windstorm um, you know, the other, uh, the, the plants can fall over. They don't have anything to anchor the roots to, right? So that can become a huge issue um, uh, for those types of setups. That's why we always recommend media beds, uh, you know, your flood and drain media beds, either with a bell siphon, a loop siphon, or a timer-based system, uh, depending on what it is that you're wanting to do. Uh, uh, you know, can it can really be it. Now, I personally am fans of loop siphons and bell siphons because they keep working unless the physics of the planet changes. And if that happens, you got bigger problems to worry about. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think a lot of people get frustrated with them because they maybe didn't quite design it right. Or what I often see is people don't give enough of a drop uh, below the grow bed. So there's no air gap. There has to be an air gap between the pipe and the water. If the pipe goes directly into the water, the air can't come back in to break that yep. siphon up through the pipe and that's one of the biggest things the other thing i see people do wrong and they get frustrated with the bell siphons is they don't have a control valve for the water going into that grow bed oh so yeah they can't reduce it if it's too fast if the water is running um you know running real low at the bottom uh, that means it's not fast enough if the water the bed's staying flooded it means you're running your flow too high and it's real easy to adjust based off of those two issues um loop siphons are really cool because loop siphons you can use on really large beds so bell siphons are generally limited to about 48 or 50 square feet of grow bed space but when you get into um loop siphons you can do loop siphons that are you know 100 by four feet you know, no problem with the loop siphon. It might take longer to drain, but um, you can also connect multiple grow beds together onto one loop siphon uh, as well, which is pretty cool so that you can have, you know, overall less plumbing if that's something that you're um, in, uh, in need of. Uh, and then you have vertical towers or NFTs. Uh, both of those are, are you know, similar. Um, I really like doing the, taking a blank fence post, you drill out like a three and a quarter inch or a four and a quarter inch uh, hole. Um, you get those cloth pots, put them in the uh, the hole, and then go get yourself a three or four inch knockout cap. Knock out the center and fold the cloth pot over the lip of the, the now O-ring that you have that's now food grade PVC. Mm -hmm. And then put that back into the, the, the tower and now you have a nice self-hanging um, uh, vertical tower that you can remove the pots individually. And it makes it really nice because you can transplant them around. You can remove them if they get old or need to be replaced. It's it's a really nice system. Uh, yeah. NFTs. Oh, go ahead. 
Okay, I was just say just for for clarity for people, when he talks about a fence post, he's talking about like the white PVC fence posts that are designed so the person wants to put up a fence and never have to do it again. And so those square pieces, I've seen a ton. Of, I've never built a tower with them. But I've seen a ton of people build with them, and they seem like they work really, really well. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's great. Uh, it's a great way to make use of the space above your aquarium. Um, you know, like you were saying, the penthes are a great way to, to you put above your fish tank or your pond, but also the vertical towers because it just drips back in. Um, and it can be another great way to kind of make use of space that's otherwise going to be kind of dead space above the those tanks or ponds. Um now you also have NFTs. Now NFTs are really good for rapid uh, production or, or you know seedlings, things like that. But the downside is is that they can get very hot in the summertime. The air and the water inside those channels can get extremely hot, and it can very much raise the overall temperature of the water in your aquaponic system much faster uh, than a media bed or a DWC raft would because of the temperature exchange. So that's something else to keep in mind is that if you're in a really hot climate, NFTs probably are not your best choice. Um, the other thing, too, with NFTs is make sure that you have an airline that goes into the top of especially longer runs. Uh, if you're doing a three or four inch pipe, um, take an uh, air stone and just put the air stone at the very end of that so that you're getting some fresh air in there. Even if it's just a drilled nipple into the top of the pipe, just to pump some fresh air in there and you'll have much less problems with root rot, pythium and, and other root problems. A lactobacillus, like we talked about in the previous episode, I think the first time I came on, uh, we talked about lactobacillus quite extensively. Um, that's another great way to add to your aquaponic system to prevent those root issues in NFT systems um, that really can make a difference. And also reduce the waste in your media beds as well, because if you're overfeeding, um, that absolutely can be a problem. Yeah. Um, when you mentioned the ebb and flow with the, uh, the bell siphons, one of the things I've seen people do where they have trouble with that siphon functioning well as well is not just having that gap before the return to the water tank, wherever that's dumping to, but also like I've always found that if you add a small bit of pipe to the bottom of that bell siphon, so it has more pull, I guess would be the way to put it rather than just have it flush at the bottom, that it seems to function better. Uh, that, that seemed to have, have cleared up a lot of problems back. I don't do bell siphons anymore, but that seemed to clear up a lot of problems when I did that. And then I don't know if you've seen, I'm sure you have knowing you, um, there is uh, plans out there for a bell siphon top piece that's 3d printed. And those things are pretty damn near impossible to fail because they have kind of this moving switch that basically when the bottom hits, they, they self purge and they allow that air gap to form because it sucks when a bell siphon sticks at the top because the water flow is reduced due to clogging or whatever, and it just won't kick over and flush. But it sucks worse when it sticks at the very bottom and it's hot out and the plants are not deep rooted enough yet to get down to where the, the little thin layer of water is left. Um, and I've never used those, but the people that have used them told me they really like them. Yeah, I've just found that if you, uh, I haven't had a chance to use those mechanical ones, but yeah. if you just have a simple uh, uh, straight down 90 degree with about a three or four inch run minimum, uh, and yep. then another 90 degree uh, uh, elbow uh, piece of pipe there. Yeah. Elbow there. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit uh, slow this morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it'll absolutely you know, cause that mechanical break. When you have too long of a, a horizontal run with that or yeah. you know, some of the other wonky designs people do, that's when you start to run into problems. Cool, cool. So um, why does the plan – you mentioned all these different planning methods. Why does it matter so much in aquaponics? Because I agree with you. Like, you know, deep water culture is great for leafy greens. I'm not trying to grow a tomato in that. I probably could figure it out, but there's just better ways to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like we talked about before, leafy greens being really good for DWC um, and then media beds for anything that's going to live longer than that. And then you, what's cool with media beds is you can modify them quite a bit, right? So you can take one of your cloth pots, fill it with soil and have it just barely touching the very uh, top of the highest flood layer. Now that's a wicking bed, uh, and depending on the depth that you plant, you can actually adjust the various um, moisture levels. So if you're going to grow something like a, a really difficult to grow plant like osha root, which is a medicinal antiviral plant, it's north, native to North America, but it's almost impossible to cultivate artificially, um, you can absolutely grow them in a commercial scale that way. Uh, same thing with you know, was if you want to grow real wasabi, that's another one that you grow. Really I was just well going to have. As soon as you yeah. said that, I'm like, what about wasabi? So go ahead. 
Yep. Uh, wasabi grows really well that way. Um, beets, radishes, potatoes, carrots, any of your root crops, onions. Um, you can grow all of those just in the root pouch, you know, sitting in your in your media bed right next to your, you know, tomatoes or whatever else. Um, I'm also a big fan of the dual root zone. I was one of the people that kind of pioneered the design where you have a pot with lots of holes in the bottom. Then you have uh, media in there or main, usually lava rock is a little bit cheaper, uh, you know, depending on where you live in the country. If not, you know, any of your standard media is fine. So about 50 percent full with the media and then a layer of burlap or other root permeable cloth and then your soil on top. Uh, and uh, what that allows is you have access to all the terrestrial microbes in the upper half. So all the different mycorrhizal fungi and all the wonderful things that many of your other uh, guests have talked about in the soil zone. And then also all the aquatic microbes. And remember, uh, if you're at the talk uh, at Jack's uh, workshop or if you watch the video, um, aquaponics actually has on average 168% more biodiversity in its um, a system than a, even a healthy living soil bed does. So now you have that super biodiverse lower half of the root zone and even and super biodiverse upper half of the root zone. And what that causes is it stimulates all of the different genes in the plant, uh, not all of them, but significantly more of them uh, that are, are respond to the plant's immune system. And, and that creates more secondary metabolites. And what that means for people uh, kind of in layman's terms, uh, or not layman's terms, but uh, in a simplified manner is that uh, the plant's going to produce a lot more essential oils. So rosemary is going to produce more, you know, the rosemary oil, thyme is going to produce more thymol, uh, so on and so forth. So if you're trying to really maximize flavor and, um, you know, essential oil production, if you're, you're going to make your perfumes or whatever else you want to do with it, that's how you do it is maximizing the biodiversity of the root system because that's triggering all this gene activation in, in those seeds and in those plants and, and giving that plant a maximum amount of um, you know, stimuli on the plant's immune system, which then turns on all of these secondary metabolite genes. And that's that's why, you know, when you talk about adding compost or compost tea or other any of the other awesome stuff that you talk about uh, on your show, um, that's why they work. It's not necessarily that they're you know, adding flavor directly, there's triggering the genes that create the secondary metabolite response in the plants. Uh, and that's why the dual root zone is so good. It also allows you to dial it in. If I want to have peppers, I can grow peppers next to tomatoes, next to blueberries, next to raspberries, and each of them can have a different soil zone uh, pH. Uh, you know, the berries are going to want to have something in the fives, uh, you know, or maybe low sixes. And then the, you know, the other ones are going to be about this, you know, whatever your normal aquaponics is, is 6.4 or 6.8 that you're keeping it at. Um, and this allows you to really min-max your, your production. I can also say, okay, I want to really heavily feed this tomato or pepper to really make it produce hard. I can just top top dress or even water in a little bit of fertilizer directly mm -hmm. into that plant, and it's going to have access to it to uptake while still drinking from the same mineral pool. Um, you know, so you can have tomatoes, peppers, lettuce, all these different nutrient requirement plants all in one system that are getting 85% of the same base nutrient, and you're just uh -huh. making minor adjustments based on each crop. And so, it allows you to really diversify much more efficiently. So just so we're clear on this, let's uh, I want to go back to like the, the stuff you're talking about with Sabi, with where basically we're doing a pot. And my understanding of what you're saying, let's say this is a little, it'd be bigger than this, but a little pot. And we're basically filling that pot with 100% soil, maybe a little yep. bit of leaker or something at the very bottom, just, just to help with drainage. And we're planting that fairly shallowly into a larger wicking bed that would be full of something like leeka. And effectively, we're watering from the bottom. Is that how you're saying you would do wasabi? Oh, yeah. So what you do is put them, like you talked about, in the pot. And then okay. just put that okay. down maybe a half inch, quarter inch into the, the when the flood layer of your, you know, pull the bell siphon out or whatever your yeah. maximum, so that your maximum flood height. Mm -hmm. And then just sit it so it's just barely touching so that yep. it gets plenty of air time to breathe. Um, and you can stick them deeper, but nothing's really going to grow in that mud layer. Like Yeah. Plants yeah, yeah. don't really like that. So you really want to have it, you know, just barely touching it. Um, alternatively, you can do a full plumbed um, uh, wicking bed where you make your, your grow bed, uh, you line it with a waterproof liner, then you put in a piece of L pipe. So a giant L shape that goes all the way across the, the entire grow bed. Usually you put yeah. a caddy wampus so that it doesn't <clears> shift <throat> on you. 
yep. uh, and then put a cap on top that you can remove. And then on the lengthwise part of the pipe in the grow bed, drill a bunch of holes in that so that it can distribute water. Then fill that up till it's just above the height of the pipe with your lava rock or whatever your you know pH inert media is. And then put your layer of burlap and then put your soil on top of that. Now you can bottom water from that just fine. What I also like to do is at the same at the top of that where the the height where the soil meets the uh, the water on the opposite end of the grow bed i like to drill a little hole and then put an overflow on that so that if i fill it up too much it'll automatic or if it rains on the grow bed which you know in in uh, texas or other parts of the country you get a lot of just natural rain you don't yeah. want that to fill up your grow bed and flood out your plants right so yeah. having that overflow with a little screen on it really can help make a big difference to make sure that you don't have those types of issues uh, long term because people often forget about that part of it and when they put them outside and then they, they end up flooding their beds I've, I've seen that happen a couple of times so the first part you described is basically like i said we've got an existing ebb and flow bed conventional full of leka and we're putting a container into the leka the second one is we're turning the entire bed into that type of system and then your dual root system we're just simply going much deeper with the soil or the yeah, so dual... with the dual root zone pot you would just put the blood and drain layer um about uh an inch uh, or half an inch below um uh the uh the where you have it in your pot so if i have my soil i want it to have about a half inch to a quarter inch before the um uh, the media flood and drain happens so, i want to so air gap. back to exactly. a pot just so everybody understands right so we would maybe put, you know, a third or a half uh, uh, lava rock leak uh, something down there. That's an aquaponics medium. We're going to put down a, a, a like a burlap or something. But unlike when I do my wicking beds where I'm putting something that's designed to keep roots out, we'll let the roots in if they want to go in. So like burlap or something or um, the burlap sandbags are great for that because they're cheap and you cut them to whatever size you want. Then you got soil and then the plants up here and then maybe your water level is not quite hitting where that that layer is but it's deeper than the other thing we talked about is that right yeah exactly okay. yeah you want to, you want a small air gap between the soil and the water flood line you don't want the water to touch the soil because what will happen is the soil will stay too wet you want to have that air gap now the other reason why you want that air gap is when the water goes down it's drafting air through the soil zone so now you're getting rapid gas exchange when the water comes back up it's flushing that air back up through this, the the root zone so you're getting this this gas exchange that works like a diaphragm inside the pot and that helps with growth acceleration you, know, you get about 10 to 15 percent growth acceleration with that versus uh you know constant flood which we've we've done a couple of times so yeah um, that's the other benefit to it especially if you're in an area where it's more humid um, that's really really going to help prevent things like the anemia in plants as well as root rot because you're getting that rapid gas exchange gotcha gotcha very cool um can you talk about maybe some of the misconceptions in aquaponics one i find is I meet a lot of people, they're preppers, obviously, with the show that I do, and they're going to set up this little aquaponic system that they saw online with like one IBC as their sump, and they're going to grow all the fish that they need for a whole year. And uh, it's it, it you get fish. I am honestly look at fish as a byproduct of aquaponics, and the main thing that you're actually doing is producing plants. What are your thoughts on that and maybe some others? Yeah, no, I completely agree that, you know, you're, you can grow, you know, four to six grow beds off of the fish from a single IBC tote, even if you cut it in half, right? So yeah. the, uh, you know, you're, again, just like you're saying, your main production is always going to be plant production, unless you have a really, really large system, yeah. um, you know, or you're going to feed like old large trees, or you're going to use it for irrigation. Now, another way you could do it, if you wanted to have more food production on the fish side, you could have lots more fish tanks, just siphon a portion of that off for your aquaponic system, depending on whatever your grow bed size is, and then use the rest of it to separate for feeding your cattle, um, that feed the grass for the cattle and feed the, um, you know, your, your larger acreage, you know, your orchards, yeah. your, your other parts of the property, um, or is it just a lawn fertilizer? You know, you could always do that as well, but um, that would be kind of a way to, to do that. Now we did do some studies in Oklahoma with hay and we grew as much on a 10 acre um, aquaponic supplemented um, uh, grass field as we did on the, the uh, uh, control 40 acres. So we were able to get the, almost the exact same ton. It was within five ton uh, or five bales or whatever 
uh, difference. So, I mean, that's a huge difference in production off of just one, you know, not that expensive input. You know, you go fish food and the power for the aeration and the pumps, you know. It's Hold not, on just a second. Are you, say, are you saying that 10 acres produced what 40 acres did in tonnage? Or are you saying that, that versus, you know, plowing and fertilizing, you got the same per acre? Which, which, which one of those is that? Yeah, yeah. So, so the 10 acre uh, test plot produced within five uh, barrels of, or bales of hay difference of uh, of that when the 10 acres was fed aquaponic water or aquaculture water for the function of, of what we're saying here okay. and then the rest of it was just naturally whatever their normal fertilizer regimen was okay. so that was the difference is the microbes and then the extra nitrates but particularly for hay it works very in grass it works extremely well because it's, it's mostly nitrates going on it and for those types of crops you're mainly just trying to feed it more nitrogen right yeah. and nitrogen fertilizer has been one of the ones that's gone up that and phosphorus has skyrocketed because of the ukraine war Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, this is a great way. You know, if you're really bleeding a lot of money on large acreage, you know, consider this because at least the fish are going to help pay for at least the cost of the production of the fertilizer long term, especially if you get into butterfly koi or you get into some of the fancier sure. fish, you can absolutely turn a pretty good profit, you know, off of it. You know, get into some of the rarer plecos and some uh, you know, plecostomus, the algae eater fish and yeah. some of the other fancy ones. You can make a killing off of the, you know, a couple spare tanks in your garage or your extra barn or whatever you have. So, and the other cool thing that we were talking, you mentioned it in the beginning of your, your uh, talk there, uh, this episode uh, about what uh, your aquaponic system can also be a good reservoir for backup water. You know, if shit hits the fan, you have thousands of gallons of water that, yeah, it needs some light filtration, but compared to what might be in the outside water that, you know, if depending on what, what's going on in the world, that could be a very, you know, one of the last sources of clean water, um, you know, that doesn't have, you know, radiation or some other nasty, you know, airborne contaminant in it, you know. So yeah. uh, people often forget about that as, hey, it is a backup water reservoir in an extreme situation that's, you know, going to be there, you know, on your property and already filled that you don't have to think about it. Water is life. If you look at two, let's say, two acre blocks of land that are exactly the same in terrain and climate and everything, and one has access, easy access to water, one doesn't. The one with easy access to water is going to sell two, three, four, five times in value. So yeah, while anything that puts more water on a property, I'm uh, I'm pretty pro with. What are some of the common things people do wrong in aquaponics? Sure. So I think the first thing is they think that the fish food is going to rely provide all the nutrients that they need for their system. Um, that's simply not true. There's no you know fish poop wasn't designed as a plant fertilizer. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just fish poop. So uh, that's one thing that I think people often get wrong. You know, you do have to add iron, potassium, calcium. All of those are going to be depleted uh, pretty rapidly, especially if you're growing a lot of crops and you're doing good. Um, those those minerals simply are going to be depleted faster than they're going to be replaced by the fish food. So those things that you have to think about. Um, and you can work those in. If you're doing pH, you know, you add calcium pH up, uh, you know, to raise your pH. You know, calcium carbonate and potassium silicate are going to be your best two. Uh, alternating obviously uh, one one dose you know to one time dose with this one the next time dose with the other one um, this way you don't have too much um, the other ones I see all the time like a hundred percent of the time when I test commercial systems they're uh, almost at zero molybdenum and very low on manganese and what this this causes all kinds of problems not only for um, you know, plant health, but also for flavor, right? So those two compounds are extremely important for terpene and terpenoid uh, production, which is your flavors you know, and, and your flavonoids as well. So if you don't have manganese, you're not going to get expression on your flavor compounds. Um, if you don't, and a lot of times too, it'll make them less heat tolerant and some some other issues, you know, across all different crops. Molybdenum is also going to prevent your plants from getting red or purple. So if you're growing red or lettuce, uh, a red lettuce or purple basil or any of these other anthocyanin producing compounds, plants they need molybdenum in order to produce that anthocyanin um, you can also use this to your advantage too and we do this sometimes in cannabis um, but it works just the same in lettuce or cabbage or anything else because it's still anthocyanin uh, if you dose a little bit um, extra so if instead of dosing like the 0 0.03 or 0 0.05 that's recommended for molybdenum parts per million you dose it at like a 0.1 um, the plants will actually produce extra um, anthocyanin to try and lock up some of that molybdenum so it doesn't negatively impact their nitrogen up, uh, uptake uh, because uh, too much molybdenum can actually cause a nitrogen uptake issue. But if you dose it to like 0.1 ppms, you're still way below that threshold, but the plant will start to react. So you can kind of force them to be darker 
than they would be otherwise, um, which is really cool. Um, the other thing that people forget, and it's never really talked about in aquaponic chemistry, is that uh, because you're a nitrate-based um, fertilizer system with aquaponics, plants have to utilize either valenium or molybdenum to convert that uh, nitrate back to a usable form of nitrogen. They have to break that molecule down. So um, if you do not have enough molybdenum, the plants will not process the nitrogen at a proper rate. Um, so you can actually hamstring the system by having the, you know, the, all the nutrients can be perfect, but if the molybdenum is zero, um, those plants still aren't really able to, to convert that nitrate back very easily. So that's something that, that really isn't talked about, but, you, you know, really, really needs to be emphasized more. Um, and, you know, sodium molybdenate is an easy way to, to solve that. So what I've always done, and I've moved more and more to what I would consider aquaculture systems. Uh, I, I, there's soil of some level in almost everything that I do. There's a few straight up uh, ebb and flows that are media only. Um, but when I was doing a lot more of uh, DWC and ebb and flow, uh, I what I would do, I would take like two handfuls of my compost and take like a, a, a bag, like a paint strainer bag and tie a thing on it and just throw it in one of the tanks. And just let it sit there like a tea bag. And I always ended up good. And I guess that's because if you're using compost that's made from good quality feedstock and you're making good compost, there's a lot of nutrient there, I guess. Oh, yeah. You're definitely going to add a lot of microbial biodiversity and some nutrients. Um, but, um, you know, the, uh, depending on what size you're doing, if you're on a smaller scale system, it's not so much a, a, a big deal. But right. on a bigger scale, you know, you really, uh, at like a commercial scale especially, you really do want to test your water at least once a month to know what's going on. And it's also often a good time, you know, the beginning of the season, test your water, make sure you know where you're starting off at, adjust it, you know, for the growth season. Uh, and then, um, you know, come back, uh, you know, maybe halfway through the growth season, test it again, make sure everything's dialed in. Um, and then, uh, you know know where you're at it really really can help and you know uh we uh, all for a long time i've been using jr peters and uh based in allentown pennsylvania they're a real group a good group of people for water testing uh and you can reach out to them uh, or i also work really closely with true aquaponics we also offer a uh, testing and dosing uh, uh service as well if you want to have everything taken care of uh you know we'll, we'll send you the exact nutrients you need for your system and uh, already pre-measured it just has a couple bags with the date on it you tear it open pour it in you don't have to know anything beyond you know how to rip open a bag as far as chemistry goes so really kind of take, takes away the nutrient thinking and the chemistry part because it's intimidating to a lot of people you know we have a lot of schools that are part of the program because they just don't have time or maybe that the person taking it over isn't the guy that built the system you know he retired so now some other person has no background and it needs to make sure this thing runs you know otherwise yeah. they're they're going to get in trouble so um we, we help out a lot of different people from you know just school systems all the way up to full commercial systems so so that service you're talking about what you're saying is that i would take a water sample send it into them and they would make me a nutrient pack and i just dump it in is that what you're saying and and if so yep. what's the name of that company again sure so it's a group that i work with uh is a, a good friend of mine true aquaponics uh, i'm the okay. one who does all the dosing on that uh through them so you know i i, I am part of that but um uh, you can go there. We also have three week nutrient packs. You can tear them open every three weeks based on the size yeah. of your system. We do, which basically try to simplify the nutrients. Oh, okay. So the three system. week packs, they're just like this won't hurt anything. So just every three weeks, put this packet in because you have X amount of gallons. Yep, exactly. Awesome. And we also have That's micronutrient awesome. packs for that. We have micronutrient packs for the grow season. So they're like every three months or every six months, depending on which one. You just rip it open, tear it in, you're done for the season. You know, you don't need to think about it. Um, we basically tried to simplify that as much as possible. But um, but yeah, the, uh, we'll, any, any size system is, is fine. Um, we do have a minimum price just because of the testing and stuff like that. But, sure. uh, you know, it's based on the size of your system. So bigger systems pay more, smaller systems pay less. Um, we also have all the different nutrients available on there individually. All of them are tested for heavy metals. So if you're worried about that, I work uh, often with cannabis clients. I use them for all my stuff because it's really hard to find. And we have to test every 10 pounds mm -hmm. of production for heavy metals with, with yeah. what I do for most of my clients. So if we fail for that, you know, that's thousands and thousands oh. and thousands of dollars that is not sellable no, That's, that's so. a Fred Sanford heart attack moment right there, you know, to lose right. that kind of production in a business where if you don't do everything right, it's hard to stay in business. And, and I've even cleaned up a, four different facilities now where you have other aquaponic experts, quote oh, yeah. unquote, uh, <laughs> and they're telling them, oh, just dose lots of rock dust or lots of kelp. And 
rock dust and kelp when used at directed levels are completely safe for your garden yeah but when you are grossly overdosing them and concentrating them in an aquaculture system that is recirculating with no exports except for the plants you can very quickly overdose now uh, now kelp depending on uh, where you get it from north sure. sea kelp norwegian and swedish kelp is really the best in, uh, in terms of heavy metals um the worst would be like anything really pacific uh, say, obviously Japan, for multiple california reasons. right yeah yeah but they often will get you for arsenic uh is the first one that's going to be uh, over toxic and then often um uh you know uh, other heavy metals as well um so that's the something and then also remember rock phosphate uh and rock dust that you have for your gardens none of that is mined very little of that is mined for agriculture this is a mining byproduct that they're trying to monetize right so you really need to be careful with some of these organic inputs they might be organic and that they're not very processed but it doesn't mean that they're clean and i think that people need to kind of remember that another great one that'll get you into big trouble with aquaponics in terms of common problems and issues that uh, you're talking about um, is uh, yucca yucca extract or any saponins with the exception of aloe will kill your fish in minutes you know two or three drops of uh, yucca extract which is commonly used as a wetting agent for both some pesticides organic pesticides and for uh wetting agents and soil mixes mm -hmm. um, will, will, will kill a whole olympic sized pool worth of fish with just a few drops so you really have to be careful with i get at least two calls a year where people don't understand why all their fish died and then we trace it back to the yucca um uh you know, that's also uh, air blown uh, pesticides is another one. I had a guy send me pictures the other day with um, uh, all of his plants were like bleaching out from the top down. And I said, well, have you used like Roundup or some other herbicide? And he goes, yeah, actually, now you think about it. I did switch sprayers when I when I sprayed. I had to use my backup one. And I was like, dude, you just you nuked your whole system. But I, yeah, I had a, a, a customer had an angry neighbor that put glyphosate in the system. And that's how we figured out what it was. Funny enough, um, you do that to someone that's like a, a serious 10 year minimum charge in the United States. Bill Nye's wife tried to do that. Because you're, she you're spending a lot poisoning a food system. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Did so that person if your neighbor does do before the effects showed up? So you could literally, you could, if you want to be a real dick as a prosecutor, like push that to like attempted murder. Oh yeah. No, yeah. I, they did it. It happened to Bill and I's wife. Uh, if you, you can look that up. Uh, huh. that he was one of like the, the main test cases for that. But yeah, if someone ever screws with their garden that on that way, you, you know, you absolutely can have them heavily prosecuted. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, I happened to, because of this one cannabis client, I knew exactly what was wrong with this guy's vegetable garden the other day. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but it's the kind of weird stuff that you run into or, you know, unless you've seen it, you, there's no textbook you can go to, to see what a glyphosate aquaponics system looks like. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What do you, what do you say about pH? Um, I, sure. I'm the kind of guy with what I do. I do what wants to grow. So I, I don't even pH test my, my systems at all. Again, most of them are buffered by soil anyway. Um, but I know that it's if you're like trying to dial certain crops in and stuff, it's incredibly important because certain certain plants won't even take certain nutrients, even if they're available, if the pH is off. Like that plant needs a certain pH to do well. You know, if I, if I, this is not aquaponics, but if I plant a blueberry plant in the spring here, It'll seem to do just fine. And you've been here, see, everything's alkaline. We're sitting on limestone. And so that plant will look really good. And then the first real heat stress it gets, it looks like somebody dumped acid on it. It just can't handle any stress given the alkalinity being too high for a blueberry. If I want to grow a blueberry, it needs to go into a container. So with that in mind, there's certain things that need certain pH levels to do well. And so how is that often misunderstood in aquaponics? Sure. So with aquaponics, your main thing is to try and keep as many of the nutrients available uh, at the same time. So your optimal pH range is 6.4 to 6.8. You know, you can go as high as seven and be okay. Yeah. Um, one thing with, with pH is if you're cycling a new system, those microbes actually need excess carbonates in order to build more microbes, right? Okay. They have to have that extra carbon in the system. So if you're cycling a new system, it will cycle faster if you start at 7.2 or 7.4 or even okay. 7.6 yeah. 
and let that pH drift down as that night in, um, you know, the carbonic acid from the CO2 production, as well as the nit uh, nitrifying process, both, um, you know, combine to reduce that pH over time uh, and then just maintain that. So, um, uh, you know, add some calcium carbonate or potassium silicate. Um, you can also add potassium bicarbonate if you, if you really need to now and then to raise your alkalinity. Um, that's another one with pH too. Alkalinity and pH are not the same thing. Correct. Uh, alkalinity is actually the dissolved carbonate hardness, whereas pH is your potential of hydrogen. So um, people often call them the same thing and they are, are completely different. If you can actually have your pH in the right range, but if your alkalinity is low, so you're not adding enough carbonates, for instance. Um, what will happen is the uh, you can test it at 8, p, uh, 8 p.m. and then test it again at 8 a.m. and you'll have these massive pH swings because right. the microbial activity, uh, usually due to, to the, the sun and, and you know photosynthetic microbes, uh, is going to have a huge impact on swinging that pH. That's why I always recommend people to, if you're going to test your pH on a regular basis, don't check it at the same time of day. Make sure oh, that you know okay. the first time on you know the first. You know, Monday of the month, you test it on, you know, 9 a.m. The second Monday of the month, you test it at noon, you know, or whatever your availability time is. But never test it always at the same time because you can actually be completely blind to pretty big pH swings if your alkalinity is is too low. So um, that's a, another thing to, to, to talk about. But um, as far as pH, I, I'd recommend checking the pH, you know, one to three times a, a, a week, depending on what you're doing. Um, even if you're just checking it once a week, that's enough to know what's going on. If it starts to drift down, um, you know, that's going to be a sign that something's wrong. You know, you're having too much nitrification. Maybe a fish died. Maybe you have too much fish waste in your system. Um, the other thing, too, if it suddenly spikes, uh, that can be a result of huge anaerobic zones. Maybe a fish is blocking one of your grow beds and it, now it's going um, and getting really low water flow. And now all that microbes are dying off and creating a, a, a spike in pH. Um, so, you know, checking your pH can help you know what's going on and, and know maybe if you're overfeeding your fish and you have way too much uh, waste in the media bed, that can also cause a raise in pH. And again, by checking the pH, you can, oh, hey, there's this other problem I need to address. Yeah. So it helps as an indicator. Um, same way that feeding your fish, you know, if you feed your fish and the water doesn't look like you just fed piranhas, something's wrong with the water, right? Like, or those fish are brand new, but it, you know, if the pH is off or the temperature's off, those fish are gonna not feed the way they normally do. That's a great indicator that you need to go and look and see why something else is wrong with your system. It's why I always advocate against auto feeders. Auto feeders are Agreed. not getting that data point, right? Agreed. So, you know, if you're going away from the weekend or something, or, you know, a week for a vacation, that's fine, but don't use them as your regular feed source because that's your main nutrient input. Right. So something yep. that takes 15 yep. seconds, you know, it, it's not it's not worth uh, you know, putting that in jeopardy to me. It just seems. Yeah, silly. there's a lot of things I could automate. I don't because I want eyes on it on a daily basis. And, and you're dead on even with my systems that are more aquaculture oriented systems. If I feed my fish and the feeding response is not what I expect, it's always an indicator. Something's not right there. There's something. Maybe there's a clogged return line and they're not getting enough oxygen. Maybe it's a swing in, in, in pH. It's, but something isn't right. Now I've seen, I guess with an aquaponic system, you're usually dealing with somewhat smaller tanks. So everybody's in one place. I've seen fish kind of change their feeding patterns kind of naturally with barometric pressure and all, but like, especially if like everything checks out second day in a row, they're not eating right. Even like a 5,000 gallon tank. I'm like something, something's off here. And it, unless you've had, like, if you have a major water temperature drop, a lot of times that'll shut them down or whatever. But if it's not, the weather hasn't really changed and the fish changed their feeding pattern, something is making them unhappy. And you want to figure out what that is before it becomes critical, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, if your, pee, your water gets too far off, the whole system can crash. Um, and then you lose everything. You know, it's one of the reasons why you have this kind of forced honesty with aquaponics is that, um, if you do cheat or, you know, screw it up, the whole system dies. You know, there's no shortcuts, really. That's one of the, the beauties of it. Here's something we found out. So I know you met David, my buddy, and we both do a lot of this stuff. And for a long time, we were using, because we deal with so much evaporation here and all our systems are outside and they're fairly large tanks. We were using water lettuce as a floating vegetation in those tanks to slow down the evaporation and what would inevitably happen happen is they got more and more uh, aggressive later in the season they would start to yellow a little bit and next thing you know you're losing fish and you pull this fish out that's that's air breathing 
The water seems fine. You've done water. Like there's no reason for this. And you look in their gills and you find these little tiny fibers is what they look like. And what it was, that particular plant, when it gets stressed and nutrient deficient, it starts dropping root hairs. And those root hairs were suspended matter in the tank. The fish were getting them caught in their gills and it was causing them to have an inability to take in enough O2. And so like, I just don't use that plant that way anymore. If I use it at all, like about midsummer, I take it out and I switch to something like water hyacinth that doesn't seem to do the same thing. And it's like, those are the kind of things I think you only learn because somebody else screwed it up and is telling you like we are right now, or you, you stay in the game long enough to figure it out for yourself. Oh yeah. And you know, uh, the, well, as far as water lettuce goes, it's great compost though. You know, you once oh, you get awesome. it going, if you harvest it off once a week, man, you got like a, a, a you know, very full com compost pile for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David actually grows these towers. He just uses like netting, um, like fencing, like kind of like I make my compost with smaller and he just throws that stuff in there and he plants sweet potatoes and he just keeps throwing it in there. And as the sweet potato vines grow, he weaves them back and forth. And, you know, they, they they lose a lot of volume when whenever you do that. So he starts out with a little soil. But by the end of the season, the thing's full, and it's like the best compost you ever made. And all it is is throwing those aquatic plants in there. And you have tons of sweet potato. You just pull it up, and they're all there. Um, and it's that, that's kind of like where you start having these overlaps. And I, I know that you don't just, just do aquaponics. You do terrestrial, too. And it's I think that everything gets better when you when – you, kind of combine elements like with your dual root zone that's what you're doing or when we're taking aquatic plants and using them as fertilizer methods for because you're also watering like you never have to water because half that plant is water so every time you throw a layer like on there is like mulch and it rots down it's watering the whole system oh yeah no it and and just like you're saying too i think a lot of people should think about it on their homestead as you know, kind of a nutrient generation machine. It's a fertilizer machine, you know, for the rest of the farm. You know, yes, you're getting immediate fish and plants out of the system, but if you, you know, set it up right, you can be fertilizing multiple different grow beds, yep. um, you know, soil and other parts of the property even uh, off of that. Um, do you have like some favorite floating vegetation to do that with? Like my big ones are water hyacinth and azola. I I, I grow duckweed too, but it, like you could just harvest the azola so much more efficiently for that kind of use as well as a little bit more well-rounded as far as nutrients go um i hate duckweed because once you get it in your system it's like impossible to get rid of um uh the only way i found that's really good if you uh, tilapia after a while we'll, we'll eat it the, the smaller tilapia yeah. but um sales and mollies uh work really really good uh, yeah, you can put them work. in your system and they love to eat the the as as well it's really been the best one but um we don't in general use too many floating plants with the with the aquaponic systems um the other bit of it is if you have too much of it it can reduce your your oxygen exchange because it's yep. kind of sealing off the top of the water and if you have hotter temperatures that can be you know a big problem and probably uh at least contributed to at least part of the issue with uh, that you were seeing with your fish was that there was just no gas exchange you know especially yeah. when the what the temperature gets up into the hundreds there in texas uh, uh See, certainly so we, can, switched, uh, we switched to the water hyacinth as our top grow and we grow that like i always harvest enough that there's an opening but that problem went away and we have i'm also now at the point where I really keep an eye on the color of that top growth. And if it starts to yellow off at all, we just do a massive harvest because if you're doing, you know, what you're doing for aquaponics, you, you would just do whatever it takes to get more nutrient in that system where it with more of like an, a garden pond, I don't really want to be throwing nutrient into that. Um, so I just kind of watch the plants, but the worst plant I've seen for it because of the, the hair roots is that. And then there's another plant that's that'll do the same thing in aquariums, but I've never really seen anybody do it in um in in aquaponics. I'm trying to think it kind of looks like a coon tail, but it's not. It's something with an A. And it's really it's a stem plant. It's really super easy to grow and propagate. Like it doesn't need any kind of a dirt bottom or anything in, in aquariums, and you stick it in and anna something. And that will do the same thing in an aquarium. Like once it takes all the nutrient out of the water, it just like sheds all its needles and it'll just jack fish up hard but i, I can't remember what it's called 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm drawing. I know parrot's feather is the one that comes to mind, but I'm not. It, it's similar form, form, but that's not it. It's uh, that, that, it, forget what you read now, but I'll look it up later. <laughs> but I used to grow it in my 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 tropical tanks in my my office here, and and you know the fact that it, it, like it does it way faster too than like the water lettuce. Like it's beautiful one day, and you want like if it just it'll take so much nitrogen so fast. Like you go to bed and you come out and it's bare. Like it's just, as soon wow. as it doesn't have enough nutrient, it's just like screw it, I'm out. And I don't know if maybe there's some sort of propagation thing it's doing when it does that or what. I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. Um, one of the other things to touch on too is that I think a lot of people think you have to be on the grid for aquaponics. Um, yeah, I've done large scale systems over in Africa that were completely off grid using just solar pumps. So you can absolutely get solar fountain pumps, uh, solar well pumps, or even the, the pumps they use to fill up the horse troughs, you know, the solar ones, but all of those can work just fine to run your aquaponic system. And people often kind of forget about that. You know, you don't need to go and build something. You can buy all this stuff off the shelf now and have been for quite a while. Um, as far as, uh, you know, off grid, uh, or, you know, a situation where maybe the power grid's gone out, um, you know, you can totally prepare for that and have it be pretty reasonably priced these days. Um, you know, most of these pumps, you can also can get, you know, you can use bilge pumps as well and run them on DC. So, you know, depending on what you're doing, you know, boat pumps work pretty, pretty freaking good as well. I would say that it's probably a good idea for anyone doing aquaponics to maybe put a little bit of that type of thing in place at least kind of a secondary redundancy uh so that if your grid goes down you know something's running to keep oxygen levels at least so everything doesn't die you know like maybe six eight hours of backup power and i have generators but what happens when the power shuts off and you're not home unless you have like i guess if you i guess if you're doing like some of your large-scale commercial like if i had a massive cannabis crop sitting in a greenhouse, I'd freaking have a standby generator for that. But like your, your home producer is probably not going to do that just for their, you know, their, their 10 tomato plants or whatever. Yeah. And you can, they actually have some, some different power outlet systems you can get now that just connect to a car battery that can run just an air, you know, just a little DC yeah. air pump or something like that. Yeah. And those can be really good for the home scale, um, you know, and not break the bank. You know, you're looking at maybe a hundred, 150 bucks to set one of those up. Uh, and again, just provide enough oxygen for the fish, um, you know, and, and you'll be fine unless you're horribly overstocked. Uh, yeah. That should get you by until your power comes back on. We yeah. had one time back when I first started doing uh, aquaculture stuff, I used to work in a pet shop uh, in Philadelphia. And one year, we had a really bad ice storm and we were there like as the ice storm hit. So we just stayed to ride it out. And we had a gas grill in the back. Um, and uh, we were heating up water bottles and, and pouring hot water in bottles and putting them in the tanks as radiant heaters to keep this whole pet store, you know, from, from dying in the power outage. And then what we did is there's another way you can add oxygen in an emergency if you're home. Um, you can do what's called peroxide dosing. So you could dose, um, you know, your 15% your peroxide at a shot glass uh, per 100 gallons uh, and pour that in the system, and that will give you enough oxygen in an emergency to... Um, you know, get your fish by, you know, uh, it works with 3% or 5% too, you know, it doesn't matter. We were using a little bit stronger to try and yeah, not use so much in a bigger facility. And that's what we had for cleaning and stuff like that. But um, you can even use the 3% and uh, at a slightly higher dosage and, um, and it'll work just fine. So that's another way too, if you're, you know, your air pump glow, you know, your battery's dead and you still don't have anything, but you can keep them warm uh, in, a, in a power outage. Um, you know, uh, peroxide dosing is, is kind of a last resort. That'll work too. And like another thing that we've done is, and I, I don't have one here, but I probably need to invest in one. And then I would integrate it all my systems is like David has a big shop comp air compressor and he runs a line out to his pond. And then he takes um, that soaker hose stuff and it makes like a giant air stone and it just wafts these like tiny bubbles all the way, and he, he's basically turned a, uh, an outdoor in-ground pool into a pond, and he's doing that. And his is really clever how he set it up. Like, you need to drain water out of those compressors every so often. So he has an automatic uh, solenoid that does that once a day, and or a couple times a day, and it runs over to a smaller tank that stays filled up that bleeds out at like three pounds of pressure to the pond. So every time that compressor dumps, it fills that tank. He lets it dump for longer than it normally would. And then that slowly bleeds out into the pond with that giant airstone effect. And it runs almost all the time because 
the secondary tank is big enough that that small amount of pressure slowly bleeds it into there. And then maybe it does that three or four times a day, that cycle. And so even if your power's off and your compressor's not running, if you have a shop compressor, that's a lot of oxygen that can be bled slowly off into those systems as a backup. And he just leaves his all the time because it's it's good for the health of the system anyway. And that was like, that was one of those moments where you're going like, my buddy's pretty smart. You know, I've never seen anybody else do that before. No, I, I haven't seen something like that. Um, uh, as far as weirder ones, I did do a, a pretty cool one where we had a whole above the tracks where we were raising the baby fish, um, we had uh, hanging columns of oyster mushrooms. And that was really cool because um, the humidity from inside the cabinets from the mushrooms was provided um, by the fish tanks below. And then all the little fitzels and all the little tiny mushrooms that you weren't really sellable, just kind of knock them off you know, into the water and then the fish just eat them. Uh, and I thought that was a really cool way to kind of, you know, heavily well, supplement fish the fish feeding. What fish eats mushrooms? That's That's news to me right there. Oh, this was baby tilapia, and the oh, like bluegill too will actually eat it. Yeah, yeah. What will yeah. bluegills eat mushrooms? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, um, the, they're they're yeah they're they'll eat they're pretty much garbage disposals. They're omnivores, yeah. so they're they're like uh, almost like tilapia but with smaller mouths. Um, the biggest problem with bluegills, and we talked about it a little bit before uh, on your show, is um, the fact that they beat the crap out of each other. Yellow perch do that as well. Um, and if you don't have some kind of way of mitigating the fun secondary fungal infections, you're going to lose on, you know, at least one a week. Um, so what I like to do is add lactobacillus, uh, to the system. You know, again, we'll dose it in aquaponics at a, a one to 1000. So one gallon of lactobacillus for every thousand gallons of system volume and to make lactobacillus is pretty easy. Um, just get some, some kefir or uh, some of the probiotic pills at your local grocery store uh, or, or a pharmacy, uh, add them to some milk um, and uh, and you can make them that way. You can also uh, do the more traditional way where you do rice wash uh, as 10% of the volume, put that into a bucket, uh, add uh, you know maybe a quarter gallon of that or half gallon of that. Uh, and by rice wash, you just take rice, rinse it real well, uh, and then take the dust from that and, and pour it in there. Um, that has some lac actual yeasts and lactobacilli on it as well. Uh, and then pour in your four gallons of milk into a, a five gallon bucket. Let it sit, you know, mix it, give it a good stir. Um, if, again, if you have kefir or uh, any other lactobacillus, even a couple splashes of non-flavored yogurt, you can do that too. Or if you have whey from cheese making, it also yeah. will work. Um, add some of that in there. Let that sit in a dark spot with a lid on it, not airtight, but just sitting on top. Uh, and that'll, <coughs> sorry, separate um, after two or three days. And uh, you'll have a layer of curd at the top and then your whey below that, which is your lactobacillus serum. Uh, take the curds. I just throw it right in the fish tank. I don't even do anything else with it. We just let the fish eat it. They'll, maul, you know, bluegill in particular love uh, the lactobacillus. Um, so, uh, that's a great way to kind of passively prevent all those issues. Uh, again, if you're making enough lactobacillus for an aquaponics system, even in every other week, um, you're going to have enough curds around to, to, you know, completely prevent any kind of pathogen issues with your fish. Give it to your dogs, give it to your livestock, eat it yourself, convert it into cheese, whatever you want to do. But just make sure you give at least a little bit of it to the fish when you when you do make it and you'll have a, a lot better uh, uh, results with uh, any kind of aggressive fish. Um, it really does make a huge difference in, in just getting uh, getting rid of those secondary infections. Also, too, if you have a fish that has uh, a pretty high amount of, um, you know, has a fungal infection or something like that, you can put them in a mixture of a 1 to 1,000 uh, dilution and let them sit in there for a couple minutes and bring them back. Just make sure you check the pH first because lactobacillus is very acidic. Um, you can actually use lactobacillus at a 1 to 1,000. It will lower your pH at about a, a 0.1 pH. So, um, you know, you can use it as a pH down for, for small systems like aquariums, things like that on large systems. It doesn't make as much sense because of the cost yeah. of the milk, but, but it's a, it's a really great feed. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. Cause what I've been doing is like, you end up with the curd and you can feed that to your fish, but the remaining liquid, you just dump that in because it's just supercharged, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Again, just don't overshoot it. You know, again, you're aiming for a one to 800 to a one to 1000 ratio so one gallon per 800 gallons to one gallon per 1000 gallons uh you know in terms of, of system health to me personally it's something that i think should be required for all food safe production for commercial systems because it's such a low cost uh input and we've completely used it to uh, eliminate um 
E. coli and salmonella from two separate uh, uh, commercial systems, actually three separate commercial systems. And I think about it um, where they had, you know, some form of E. coli or some other pathogen in it. They failed for state testing with the water. We went and treated it within 14 to 30 days, depending on which one we're talking about uh, with just using lactobacillus. Did not have to completely sterilize the whole system. Didn't have to break the cycle of the system. Didn't have to kind of bring the system down for three months and bring it back online like you would traditionally would have to. We were able to completely eliminate it and and pass state testing again after 30 days in all cases. So, you know, you, there's a lot of things that some of these microbials can treat and solve that you simply don't have a chemical alternative to. Even if you wanted to go, you know, a traditional, you know, standard route, there isn't an alternative. Same thing with yeah. like um, treating septoria and things like that. You, you know, in soil, they tell you to, to throw it out, throw the soil away. We can treat it in two weeks. So, you know, they're using that same protocol in soil. So, well, and it's not just an additive, right? I mean, if you're feeding the curd, you got to feed the fish anyway. And I've noticed like goldfish nibble on it, uh, or, and, but I haven't noticed the catfish really pay attention to it. I'm sure they'd eat it if they were hungry enough. But the freaking bluegills act like you threw, like, remember the old like 80s B movies, like with, like piranha, and they put like a horse leg on a rope and they, it's totally fictitious. They throw it in, they count to 30 and pull it out. And it's like, they eat it like that. They go freaking ballistic on that curd. Oh yeah. No. And it's, it's just a great way to prevent issues. You know, I know you're a big fan of keeping Cardenias and the Arcadenia shrimps, yeah. the little uh, cherry shrimps. Yeah. Um, if you add it to there, they love to eat it. It also prevents all the different fungal fungal diseases that they have with them and their eggs. It makes them much healthier. It's really heavily used in shrimp production. Well, the reason I, I I like it so much for that is if I want shrimp out of one place to put in another, I just take like one of the four inch net baskets and I set it on a rock where it's just enough water for them to get inside. And I put a lump of that in the box. I used to use an algae tab for that. But when you use the lab, they come much harder and you'll pull this net thing up and there's you know a thousand little shrimps flipping around. And it. it's like you wait 20 minutes if you do it in the evening and it's more than you need wherever you're putting them and it's no work instead of sitting there trying to net them out or whatever um yeah they're, they're you can cool put them in cheesecloth you can put it in cheesecloth and use it to get uh uh you know crayfish and, and crabs when you're out going to just go trapping so it works so good too stuck in it i guess oh and just as a bait you know the, it works okay. better as a bait yeah okay all right cool um let's see um what about let's let's talk a little bit more about like proper microbial inoculations in aquaponics. Sure. So if you want to have a really healthy aquaponic system, um, you want to do the lactobacillus at least every other week, like we just talked about, uh, at a one to one thousand ratio. The other one that you want to do is is liquid IMO. Now, liquid IMO, you can look up lots of different videos of IMO. Matt Powers is a great video. I know he's been on your show plenty. I have some videos on IMO collection on my YouTube channel as well. Um, Chris Trump is another really good resource. Hopefully we'll get him on your channel someday. He's a, a good friend of me and Matt's. Tell him to fill he's out a guy. form, man. All he's got to do is fill out a form. I'll have him on. Sure. Yeah. No, I'll totally uh, send it over to him. Um, uh, but uh, he's the guy who taught Matt and I both uh, on this particular method that we're going to talk about. So uh, IMO stands for indigenous microorganisms. And it's honestly like the best thing you can make for your property in terms of fixing problems with your plants. You can heal old diseased trees this way. There's all different types of cool stuff that you can do with it. But what the main concept of it is, is that you're gathering the local healthy uh, microbes in your um, area and then uh, um, uh, collect them, concentrate them, and now use them in a concentrated form in your garden. So um, uh, the Vikings used to do this. So the Vikings back in the day used to, used to do a similar method where they would collect the healthiest soil from the best part of the summer uh, and then put that into a ram's horn um, before the winter would set, pack it, put a wax cap on it, and bury it below the frost line. Then in the springtime, as soon as the surface thawed, they dig up the horns uh, and then break open that wax seal and then put that fresh, you know, the spirits of the garden is what they interpreted it as. But basically, they were re-inoculating it with all that healthiest microbes that they had from the previous year that were staying dormant because they're in that cold state underneath the ground. So... We're going to do that same method only a little bit more efficiently. So what you want to do is take a bunch of rice. I'm going to talk about two different formulas for this, but the first one, take a bunch of rice, cook it about 80 to 85% of the way until it's you know, almost like al dente pasta um, uh, in terms of uh, hardness, not fully cooked where it's soft, but 
you know, still a little bit of firmness to the rice. Then you're going to take that and put it into a basket, um, usually an open weave basket that has a little bit of spaces between it. You don't want anything too super tight. Um, and then uh, you can get them at the dollar store or, you know, grocery store, wherever you want to get them. Uh, and then put that in there and maybe a four four to five inch lay, deep layer. You, if you go too deep, what will happen is the center gets too wet and it goes anaerobic and you don't want that. Um, um, and then you're going to put a piece of screen on top of that in your basket. So you have your, your open weave basket with a layer of four to five inches of, of your mostly cooked rice with a screen on top with just a couple of zip ties or whatever you want to do to secure it just to keep the squirrels and stuff out of it, neighborhood dog, whatever. Um, and then you're going to find a nice little patch of on your property or a neighbor's property or even in an area where you know that is particularly healthy an old growth forest area near you and you're going to put that basket out there uh, in the, the duff right so in the leaf litter and all that maybe clear a little bit of it away so it's sitting right on the ground so that you get all the spores and access to the fungi and things like that they're going to find that rice and the bacteria and microbes and other things the insects there will help bring in some of the spores and stuff as well and you're going to put a, a cover over top of it so it doesn't get rained on. A trash bag, uh, old dog food bag, whatever you have that's just going to keep the rain from dumping into the rice. So that the rice has doesn't get any more moist is the, is the point. You can also take a look around in the forest. And if you see a little bit of, of wood or leaves that have a piece of mycelium on it, the white fungi that grows on those, um, take that and just drop it into the top of your basket, and that can also help speed up inoculation and ensure that you have a good collection. And that's a method that I, I, it's not really talked about as much in traditional natural farming, but it's a method that I know Chris Trump uses and I've switched to using as well. Um, so now you're going to let that basket sit in that forested area for, you know, four to six days, depending on how hot it is. If it's really hot, you can usually harvest it after about four and a half, five days. Uh, if it's really cold, you know, maybe six, seven, even eight days or longer uh, in a colder environment. You know, you really don't want to do this if it's below about 45, 50 degrees because there's no microbial activity really going on when it gets that cold in, in the air. So now you have your, your fully inoculated rice that's filled with fungi and, you know, forest microbes. You're going to take that and you're going to weigh it. So we're going to say, oh, that weighs half a pound. It, it, well, just for the sake of argument, it's half a pound. Now you're going to weigh out half a pound of brown sugar and combine them. So you're going to put them into a container and you're going to stir it and mix it. I have a video of this on my YouTube channel uh, and you're going to mix it. Now, the reason why you do this is the sugar uh, locks out the oxygen and the moisture and changes the osmotic pressure, which for most of these microbes and fungal spores that we're talking about, converts them into their spore form. So they'll immediately go to like the stasis form where they're they're in like suspended animation where they can kind of remain shelf stable for up to three years so now we have our shelf stable um you know uh collection from the forest uh, what we want to do is take a large teaspoon of that plop that into our bucket with some air stones um, you can put it into a little onion bag if you want to i usually just dump it right into the bottom that it's you know it'll bubble around while I'm doing it and then you want to have four to six or even eight air stones you know the more aeration the better um, and put them all around the different portions of the fish tank uh, alternatively if you're doing a bigger batch put all of your stuff into like a paint strainer your IMO2 uh, into a paint strainer and then put one to two extra air stones in that paint strainer and suspend that in the center of the thing if you're doing a 55 gallons or 30 gallons uh, if you're just doing five gallons you don't need to do that but you know for larger volumes it, it does matter uh, and then put lots of air stones in and then brew that for another you know 24 to 36 hours and what that'll do is now it's going to wake back up all of those microbes that we had and now now it's in a liquid form all you have to do is uh, run it through a strainer or a pre-filter and you can pump that right into your irrigation lines right out to your, your soil crops um, um, wh what i like to do is take that liquid imo and pour that into the aquaponic system again at a rate of one to one thousand uh, if you're using an mbbr filter pour it into the mbbr um, which is a moving media bed reactor, uh, a moving bed, bead bed, I don't know, I don't use them, I forget what the acronym is, yeah. but I know a lot of people have them for their systems, pour it in there instead, because it's going to help inoculate that, but um, simply by adding that liquid IMO, that will uh, dramatically increase phosphorus production, uh, iron production, and lots of other things that, that is already present in the system, but it's not being converted into that plant usable form. So you'll actually have an increase in overall of, you know, 60 to 80% total PPMs that are bioavailable, uh, more bioavailable with the addition of liquid IMO versus without, because you're kind of filling in some of the gaps of the food web in the aquaponic system. You know, an aquaponic system isn't like soil. It doesn't have all the different 
components to it because you you made the thing right you have this closed loop of water so by adding the liquid imo you help fill in some of those different mineralizing microbes that would normally be missing from the system so it really does help um you know min max your your either soil system or aquaponic system it's the best thing you put in your garden now let's use this as an example how would i treat my diseased apple tree okay so i can use this to treat apple trees so if I uh, find a good healthy apple tree down the street, I, have an, I know there's an orchard with really healthy, healthy apple trees, I can go do a collection from the healthy forest and, or the healthy trees of that same or similar species and then take that and inoculate my apple tree at home. And that often can times can get rid of things like fungal infections or bacterial infections of the root systems that are otherwise untreatable in traditional uh, arbory or agriculture. Um, they'll tell you, you, oh, the tree's dead, cut it down we can reverse that i managed to treat fusarium and banana trees which is like supposed to be this apocalyptic thing with three treatments of a lactobacillus followed by three treatments of imo same thing with septoria where you, you're told you have to throw the soil away you, you can't yeah. use that field you need to let it rest for two years fuck all that you don't i'm sorry screw all no, you of that. Can, we, we okay. embrace the full color of the english language here <laughs> you're fine all right well you don't need to do any of that you can absolutely just you know within 30 days treat that problem and be be running man like the, the people don't quite realize that they have all of this stuff on their property you already have all the microbes to treat most of the problems you have especially fungal root problems these types of issues already exist on your property you just need to concentrate them and redose them gotcha. now let's talk about oh damn it <sighs> He probably doesn't know he's locked up. Steve, you're locked up right now. There we go. There you go. We're back. All right. All right. Go ahead. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, anyway, yeah. So another way you can do this is so instead of just doing your rice, so let's just take, for example, we're doing a kilogram of rice for the um, uh, collection, right? So instead of doing a thousand grams of rice, we're going to do 700 grams of rice and 300 grams of insect frass or crab uh, meal, uh, lobster meal. Um, some other uh, chitin heavy um, uh, source, usually insect frass. Um, you can also get local crickets, you know, get a bucket with a, a, a light bulb right above the water, collect all the bugs, strain it, and weigh it. That works good too. Um, that's actually preferred if you can get local bugs. Or hey, you got grandkids or little neighbors that are being obnoxious, give them a nickel or a penny for every bug they collect or whatever and let them do it that way. That's how we did it in Africa. We just gave them all a nickel per, per bug and we had buckets full. Of, we kind of regretted that, but uh, it did get us what we needed. So um, when I was in Zimbabwe, this saved my butt um, because we had grasshoppers that were eating the Cambrian layers off of all the plants and the plants would just fall over like this. It yeah. was horrible. Yeah. Um, uh, so what we ended up doing was uh, we you take 700 grams of rice and 300 grams of insect frass. And you're going to mix it together and then you're going to cook that just like we talked about cooking the rice together but it has the insects parts in it and the insect enzymes and liquids and things like that is getting infused into the rice now you're going to take that put it out the same way you would for your imo collection for five days in the forest but now um you're collecting the fungi that loves to feed on insect frass and chitinase right so now it's a, a, a pesticide version of instead of the root microbe version now we're making a pesticide version so now it's all of your local microbes that love to feed on the exoskeletons of insects uh, that you're collecting so now you can take that weigh it 50 percent you know equal parts sugar combine it to imo2 and then brew that up just like we talked about with imo uh, and then liquidly apply that as a foliar spray to your crops and it will kill just about every bug no it doesn't work super well on mites it does work on broad mites but we haven't tried it on spider mites to the point where I can say it works 100%, but um, grasshoppers, um, leaf hoppers, stink bugs, squash bugs, blister beetles, um, Japanese beetles, uh, a whole bunch of insects that are normally really hard to treat with any kind of biocontrol yeah. just annihilates them. Yeah, they're uh, like mummies. Uh, yeah, yeah, they get covered. Yeah, you, I, you had pictures in the presentation. They get yeah. completely covered in this white fungi. That just obliterates it. and what's cool is you can drink the stuff right it's it's you, there's not many pesticides that work like that that are completely safe you know if your kids get into the barrel and drink some they would have a stomach ache but that's the worst of it right there's yeah. no the chemicals that are gonna hurt anything it's not gonna hurt your livestock it's not gonna hurt your dog or your cat it's not gonna hurt the fish in your pond that you want to catch and eat later you know it's not gonna hurt any of that um 
and it works extremely well at a, just a wide range of insects and it's only stuff from your own property so you never have to worry about contamination or or oh it, it worked really good this year but not the next year it, you know it, it's constantly you know in that arms race with the, whatever else is going on locally so on your on the initial capture so I watched one of Chris's videos on that. And when he got the whole box, I'm like, everything's good. The box is set up and all. And he makes this giant tent over it to keep it from getting rained on. And I'm like, that looks like a pain in the ass. So here's what I came up with. I have all these pieces of three foot fencing I use for everything around here. And one of the things I use them for, when I plant a new tree, goose rage is a thing. And a goose will walk past a sapling tree a thousand times and not care. But a new one, a new one is something new. And a new one is designed, it has to be killed. So the geese will literally eat the crap out of the tree until they kill it from the cambium, like like the insects you were talking about in Africa. So I take these little tiny, you know, about a foot and a half diameter uh, fence things when I plant a new tree and I just throw it around that tree until the tree's big enough and until the geese have been like, okay, it lives here too and it doesn't want to kill it anymore. So what I ended up doing, I built a capture box and I cut one of those tree protectors in half. And so it's kind of like a cylinder, you know, like that. And imagine the bottom's open. You set the box where you want it, put the cylinder around it, take a piece of scrap plywood, set it on top of the cylinder. Animals can't get in and remain protected. And it's 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 all like you, know, you can carry it in two hands and you're out there and set up and you're done in minutes. And I thought that was kind of cool because setting up tents pisses me off because we get a lot of wind. <laughs> so like... Yeah. That was really simple to do. And at a foot and a half, you cut them in half, so they're a foot and a half high. So unless you get a serious windy rain, you're not going to get rain in from the side. Yeah, no, as long as it can get some some air passed through at the bottom and it has a couple of, you know, open spaces so those spores can blow in, then you're yeah. perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah, that's worked really well. And it actually got me to do it. That's the other thing. Like, if something's enough of a pain in the ass where I got enough going on, I won't do it. Um, can we... Um, Talk a little bit about pre prevent. Well, I mean, kind of have, but you want, you have anything else on preventing diseases in aquaponics for fish and humans? Yeah, I mean, the number one thing you can do if you want to prevent diseases is the lactobacillus so sure. you know, Nothing has made a night and day difference as much as that in terms of just stopping just not only a wide range of foodborne pathogens, but also a wide range of, of plant, you know, fish based ones and human based ones as well. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention, since we're on the topic of pathogens, um, University of Hawaii did an eight-year study where they were doing everything from injecting fish with E. coli and salmonella, injecting plants, dumping it in the water, um, and they never had any tests come back after the end of the full test where anything was infected, right? The microbes were able to balance everything out. Um, and, they, you know, so it, because of the biodiversity of aquaponics, you don't have these diseases that just rip through um, the system that we do it for hydroponics, at least in terms of the plants, fish is a different story uh, because fish have their own problems sometimes. But, um, you know, for the most part, if you're getting fish from a reputable source, you're not going to have problems. One of the other things, too, for preventing um, diseases with your fish is salt dosing. One pound of aquarium salt in a five gallon bucket. Just take your fry, dip them in there for you know, uh, oh. 60 to, to 90 seconds or when, okay. before you put them in the system and you've just sterilized them. If there was flukes on them, anchor worm, uh, paintbrush worm, um, you know, any fungal infections, uh, any kind of ex ulcers, anything like that, it's going to kill all that. The only thing that's going to survive that maybe be streptococcus or some of the other internal diseases, but that'll uh, absolutely uh, completely kill off, you know, almost all of your external parasites and external disease. Ick is another one that'll that is easy to treat really? that way. But so it's, it's 60 to 96 because I need to start doing that. I use, I almost never buy fish. I, I collect local fish and I usually isolate them for like a week and kind of observe them. And if anything looks wrong, but you could still have pathogens you don't know that are there aren't evident yet. So you said it's a pound to five gallons. Yep. One pound of aquarium salt. You can get them at any pet store you know, that sells fish basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, that'll put the, the salinity at about uh, 0.20. Uh, so it'll be not quite seawater, but almost. Um, and then, you know, just in there that long, because remember the osmotic pressure of the, the high salinity to low salinity makes them just kind of explode. If you watch them in like a viewer, you can see the little flukes and stuff come off of it. It works in reverse too. If you have a saltwater aquarium, um, you can dip them in fresh water. And again, it, you, you'll see the parasites come right and, off. And the, of fish, the and fish won't get overly stressed by that short duration in, in that water. No. Okay. no. And the other cool thing, the other good thing to use that exact treatment, the salt dipping is, 
You ever have a fish that has a swim bladder problem and it's constantly at the surface or it can't get to the surface because it has a balance issue with a swim bladder? I have. Uh, and about people... swim bladder issues is like fishing deep and you poke a hole in them to let them go because the pressure changed. But I know it happens. Yeah. So what you can do is, and it's, you see people look like wheelchairs out of like airlines and weights and s silly crap like that. Yeah. Um, what you can do instead is if you take them and you put them in that high salinity water, um, there's a mechanism in the fish that helps kind of trigger the release of the, the kind of spasming for the, the swim bladder and then makes it kind of reset. Uh, it, but it has to have a big salinity difference. So by putting them in the salt water, they're going to expel all the air, salt, suck in some of the salt water. That's going to clean that and sterilize the swim bladder and then expel it back out. And then now when you put it back in the fresh water, it'll kind of reset it. It doesn't always work, but it works 70% of the time for, for treating those fish with swim bladder issues. Pretty low um, sometimes risk, they're just, high return. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they're injured. But, you know, if you have an expensive koi or goldfish or something yeah. else that you really care about, it can be a way to treat them that's pretty simple and very cheap. Yeah, I mean, I sold a, just a garden variety butterfly, like kind of creamsicle looking koi last year that was about yay big and about two foot and i think i had bought that fish as a baby at pet smart for like six bucks and i sold it for three hundred dollars on craigslist right? right so i mean there could be some value in a fish like that and i mean if you want money out of fish in aquaponics unless you were specifically really dialed in for production i'm i'm gonna say that ornamental fish are way more of the way how many freaking tilapia would you have to sell to make 300 bucks where you could sell and, you know you could and for like most of the people that are going to listen to this steven they're not going to be commercial producers these are backyard producers homesteaders etc you know my thing is i can sell one fish a year and i pay all my food for all my sisters for the whole year off of that one fish uh, we David came up with this. So you take the little comments you get for like nine cents for feeders and you go in, you buy like five bucks worth of them and you throw the chick an extra five bucks and you say like, Hey, you know what? Do me a favor. Pick out as many as you can that are multicolored. Like don't get too sweaty about it, but just, you know, and they'll do it. They'll do it. So they do that. And some of them will just be beautiful when they grow up. And if you put on the like Craigslist or something, that it's a, a comet goldfish. Nobody will buy it. But if you call it an Asian heirloom carp, some yuppie will buy that thing for $50. So you bought a nine cent fish, you sell for 50 bucks. And again, how many of the, like you can't sell a thousand of those. The, the, you know, there's only so many people that will do that. But if you could sell 10 of those a year, that's $500. You know, that's, that's yeah. side hustle money kind of thing going on. Yeah, no, if, if you're wanting to monetize it, nothing really beats a uh, butterfly koi. They really do have the best dollar gain per inch gain um, of all the fish. You know, tilapia, you're looking at about two bucks yeah. wholesale for fish. So you're not, you know, you're not going to do anything with that. Um, the best monetized edible fish really is bluegill. Um, they do tend to have a little bit better plate price because they're not the easiest thing to come by. Yeah. So restaurants usually willing to give you a little bit better one, you know, price point. And you can raise a lot of them in a smaller tank. Um, my, compared my, to some favorite, fish. my favorite, not for mo money, but I guess if you're eating it, it can be money. And, you're, you know, you can calculate what it would have cost to buy food. Is a fish that everybody hates. Blue uh, bullheads, bullhead catfish. Like if if you kill bullheads, you did something wrong. I mean, you really did something wrong. Um, and I learned this method of cleaning them. I never liked them before because you get this little tiny fillet off this thing with a head that's this big. Uh, but I found this old man on YouTube, and he's called shucking. And when you're ready to process them, you take that. I'm not sure what you call that fin because it's not a true fin on the back end. That the tab fin that catfish have, you take Ain't a sharp no knife. Yeah, yeah, and you take a sharp knife. You go under there and you kind of slit through the skin all the way up to the spike. You turn the knife, and the only thing you have to be careful of is you don't want the edge of the knife to touch the skin side it's touching, and you crack the backbone. You take the fish and you go, and you break it, and you grab it with a pair of pliers and you pull. And in this hand, you have a head, guts, and skin. And in this, in the in the pliers. It's got bone in, but it's a skinless, perfect. You might have the bloodline you knock out with your fingernail. So I'll go out to one of the tanks, throw some freaking night crawlers on a little fishing rod, and I'll pull like four of those out. And in less time it takes me to get them out of the water, I can have them processed in a frying pan. And you take a knife and cut some slits in the side because there's a lot of fat in, in bullheads. And they're freaking delicious. I mean... Um, I have found that you want to harvest them for best 
texture when the water's cold. Like you don't really want to harvest them in August. They get a little more mushy tasting, but that's a chef thing. Like throw some salt on them for a couple hours before you cook them and that'll pull that extra moisture they're holding out. But those, and, and I can get literally as many of those as I want. I can, I, so for bait, what we use for them, we use like Walmart cheap frozen shrimp. And we'll take like a bag of that and we throw it in a Tupperware thing and cover it with salt and then leave it for a couple of days and then just rinse the salt off them and throw them in a bag. They'll keep forever, even without refrigeration, though I don't invite, throw them in the refrigerator. And you cut little pieces of that and you can catch 10 of them on one piece before they steal it because it's so tough from the salt. And so like what I'm encouraging people with telling that story is like my big deal is like I think it's great all these things we can do to fight diseases and all. And deal with water chemistry and all, but local fish are used to local water and local water chemistry and local climate and local temperature. And if you do it right, they can be free. And I, you got to be careful, right? Like check local regulations. But here in Texas, if you go to a pond somewhere, throw a handful of corn in, wait a few minutes, and throw a cast net. And as long as you got a bass or something like a game fish in there and throw it back, there's no problem, right? You're good. And so bluegills are not even considered game fish in Texas. So you can get a thousand of them in a weekend. Um, but if you do that in Pennsylvania, they will totally put you in, you know, rabbit sheriff jail. Like you can't do that there. So check local uh, situation. But I love using local fish. I don't know if you do that at all. Or, I mean, your operations oh. are often more like commercial and stuff. So yeah, we usually go with aquaculture fish just for the disease aspect. But yeah. um yeah, definitely don't go. Uh, make sure you check your regulations beforehand. <laughs> Depending on what species you do, it can be an automatic ten years in jail. We used to yeah. always joke when uh, when I used to work in the pet trade, people would be like, "Oh, I'm going to Florida. I'm going to go down to the reef and collect some fish." And we're like, "All right, we'll give them a styrofoam box and be like, what you want to do is bag of fish, brick of cocaine, bag of fish, brick of cocaine, because the cocaine is less jail time. So you <laughs> might as well bring back the blow and at least pay for the trip if you're going to get the coral." And, and like because it's uh, like, like reef fish is 10 years automatic no yeah. no good behavior like you are staying there for 10 years um same thing with migratory birds you know you get caught shooting a hawk or something like that um that's 10 years automatic no offense or buts fishing game also never pick a fight with a fishing game warden they are them and the border patrol the only people who do not need a warrant um i've screamed at two cannabis producers for this where they went and had us a big you know to do with a, 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 sh a ranger um, that wanted to do a, a creek study or something on their property and it's like listen they can search every ounce of your property without a warrant at the drop of a hat do never pick a fight with those people they are they are the last law enforcement agency that you ever want to pick because they're exempt from most of the normal rules and regulations that can protect you from a unlawful search and seizure so um, that's another good good point to bring up but in most places, you, you know, you can collect most of your, 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 you know, fish within reason, or you can just go, uh, most states actually, you can go on to the Fish and Game Wildlife, uh, Fish and Wildlife website, and they'll actually have a full list of all the people that are registered to sell game fish in your state. They, they, it's kind of required by law in most states. So yeah. it makes it really simple to find the local guy near you that has bass or whatever fish it is that you want to stock your stuff with. And, and let me reiterate, like, know all the regulations, what you say can make what you did that was legal, illegal. So, for instance, in Texas, it is illegal to collect fish to keep captive, right? You can get as many. There's like no limit on bluegill. You can have all the bluegill and bullheads you want. If I'm ever asked, and I've only ever been asked once and been living here since 1993, what are you doing with them? They're bait. They're bait. So what do you, well, I catch bullheads because we use them to catch flatheads in the river. Oh, cool. And then you'll have a conversation about flatheads with a, because most wardens actually like fishing and hunting. That's why they do the job. Um, oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to take it home and throw them in my, I'm just, you know, I can keep my bait alive any way I want for as long as I want. But if I were to tell that person exactly what I'm doing and he wanted to be a dick that day, I'm not going to jail in Texas for that, but I'm going to pay a fine and he's going to make me put my fish back and, you know, maybe he'll steal a fishing rod. Who knows? So just be careful what you say. But then the other side of it is if like, you know, somebody with a stock pond on private property and it's their own and they don't let it, you know, it's not open to the public, go get, get the hell whatever you want out of there. Like that's oh yeah, a different situation, depending on your Absolutely. state. I'm, I'm back. I am only speaking for Texas. Just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, again, if it's a private pond, there's, there's no regulations on that. And what we're talking about, is just uh, navigable waterways and other publicly accessible, yeah. you know, stuff that's designated for that and stocked by the, the state. So. That's where your rules are going to apply, uh, you know, on private land. That's uh, usually private land's rules. 
Yeah. Let's take a few questions and then I want you to tell people about some of the courses they can take with you and we'll let them know about sure. that. But let's start out with some questions. I just have a few here. Um, this person said, I would like to use my three ponds, but two of them are overrun by lily pads. Eventually, I want to do simple aquaponics. Now, I asked this question because I know the first question is how big are these ponds? So these do not seem ideal for aquaponics in the traditional sense to me because he said they were about 20 yards by 20 yards. You know, we're looking at 20,000-ish gallons in my head if there's any depth to these things at all, minimum. So I've always called an aquaponics system an intentionally overstocked and overfiltered system. So doing that with 20,000 gallons of water is a different world. But are there some ideas that maybe you could give him to implement some aquaponics type things into a pond that size? Sure. So so if you wanted to use that for aquaponics, first off, I would go ahead and put additional aeration on it so that you could stock it heavier, um, just like you were saying. Uh, and then I would start to, to you know, feed it on a, on a heavier basis until you get those nitrates up to at least 20 parts per million in the pond. Um, and then what you could do is just plumb you know, regular old grow beds right right to the side of the pond. You know, I know many different people that have whole rows of different grow beds right next to the pond. It just pumps in there and then dumps right back in the pond. Um, you know, it goes on a, a timer. Some of them even shut off at nighttime, uh, depending on what you're doing and how much, how deep the, they are. And if you have a little bit of water retention at the bottom, um, you know, that, that can be another option. But usually just, uh, you know, again, add aeration, um, start to, to feed the fish much heavier, increase the stock density of that pond. Remember that when you do that, especially when the temperature gets real hot, that oxygen level is going to come down. So you have to have that supplemental aeration, either a paddle wheel or air stone or whatever you want to do that makes sense for your volume um, or fountain, you know, putting in a large fountain, that can be another way to, to add oxygen. Just remember that fountains are going to increase the air temperature much more because that evaporative cooling is also heating that water that dumps back in. So sure. keep that in mind depending on where you are in the country. But that's what I would do. And then as far as the lily pads, you know, just thin them out. You know, lily pads are another great way if you have lots of them and they're pretty, resell them. You know, they, they're on a long tuber. You can piece that out. And, and especially this time of year before it hasn't really popped up yet, get in there before it really starts growing, pot those up and sell them. You know, you can use that to buy the, the rest of the stuff that we just talked about without, without having to you know, do that. You know, most of the lily pads start off at 30 bucks. You know, they're yeah. not cheap. No, they're, they're, all you're getting is a chrome, let alone something potted up that's started, right? Like, uh, I, I think it's aquarium plants. Still, no, it's there's a, a place I've bought some aquatic plants from. And yeah, they're, they're somewhere between 20 and $40, depending on the variety and all you're getting is a crown, a piece of that, that root tuber that they, they whack off. And now I have a few in some of my garden ponds and I have to actually remove some every year or the, they'll get to be too much. Uh, to me, it, ponds of that size, if you don't want to play around with trying to jack your nutrient load up, what they're fantastic for probably would work well with like your dual root zone stuff because you've got soil there or what I do are what I call flow through wicking beds. So I've got, like lava rock and perforated pipe in the bottom to create a, a battery of water. And then I've got like a weed blocker and then I'll do just because it really makes the wicking work easy and it's cheap. If you buy it in big bulk bags, I've got like a two inch layer of perlite. And then I've got like a really nice fluffy soil, compost based soil all the way up to the top. And you plant into that and you can run those on a timer, let's say 15 minutes twice a day on an $8 timer. And all that does is pump water in, and then you have an outlet that controls the water level at the bottom of that wicking bed. And that returns that water back to the pond. And you could build as many of those as you want and size your pump accordingly. And you really can't screw that up because whatever you want to fertilize your plants with, you have that huge soil layer to do it in. But if you do what I'm talking about, you really don't want to do kind of that dual zone like you do with the permeable thing because roots will get down into the bottom and they'll jack up your flow. Uh, and that could run constant flow, too. I just find that it, if you run it constant flow, you, you end up, even though you're below the soil level, you start leaching nutrient. Where if you run them like 15 on, 15 off, or 15 on and like 12 hours off and then 15 on. And I run them this time of year, I turn them off. The, they just don't need irrigation. The cool spring, cool fall, I run them once a day. And in midsummer, because there's more evaporation, I run them twice a day. And so you could do that. And you don't even have to worry about like overfeeding your fish or whatever, because now you can do anything you want at the soil level with IMO. You can do it with you know good compost, compost uh, teas or extracts or, or whatever you want to do. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it, it's a, a, a great way to, to hit all your different uh, 
uh, things that you needed to, to make the garden really succeed. Now here's one. I, I get this a lot and I know there would be a point where it would stop being an issue, but this guy says, can biochar be used as a medium? And I think he's talking about nub and flow beds. So I have seen somebody make biochar out of like nutshells. They were like walnut shells or something like that. And the, uh, I can't think of the term now. Uh, there's a, a type of allopathy that they have. It. What is the species of like pecans, walnuts, and all? They're in uh, juglum. When you make biochar, that's gone. So that, that's not an issue anymore. Uh, and it looked like really good sized medium and a nice, you know, because it kind of floats. And so when you get that fill, you get that lift and drop. Uh, but it's immediately going to start taking all the nutrient out of a system but there would be a point where like it's kind of filled up all the little compartments and it, it would no longer happen. But initially I think it would just plunge your nutrients. Now I asked Michael Whitman, who's kind of like the biochar guy, how long he thought you'd have to run an ebb and flow system to fully charge the char to the point where like it would stop doing that. He said probably a week to two weeks. I feel like it would be a lot longer. What, what do you think about all that? Sure. So uh, we've actually tested this when I worked okay. at the aquaponics source. We test the whole three by three media beds. We also tested it as the pouch media for our vertical towers. Okay. Um, this is the problem with biochar. One, it does strip micronutrients, just like you talked about, until it reaches saturation. Um, it does take, you know, two to three weeks before that happens, depending okay. on stocking density. The downside is a couple downsides to it. Um, it breaks down after three to six months into like liquid mush and becomes a silt in the system. Okay. Um, because the microbes are very good at breaking it down once it's been biocharred. So that's part of it is it just disappears into the system and becomes a mess. Okay. Um, the other part of it is when you have it in a media bed, when it floods and drains, if you ever have media that's shifting up and down, what yeah. will happen is it eats the plants from the bottom like a, like it's getting eaten from a worm from tremors. So the, yeah. the plant, you have a tomato and it starts off at the start of the day at the ground level and then it just goes lower and lower and lower oh. below, below, but, below the, the soil there. Yeah, because it, the weight flow. of the plant Lika is... Floats, but Lika doesn't float that much. No, no. But okay. with the meat, uh, so they're, they're, once in a while they'll screw up the batch of uh, hydrogen. It happened to me twice over the years. And they screw up the gas mix and it floats and then we have to send it all back because it's useless. Um, right. But uh, I've, they, they screwed up two batches on me over the years. But otherwise, it's a great product. I love Mother Earth Hydrogen. Um, I would use hydrogen if you're going to use it for education because jamming your hands into that medium all day with the round pebbles, I can yeah. do that. So if I'm educating, it's worth it. But if it's just the backyard system and you're not in it all that often, just go with Lava Rock. You can get a super sack of Lava Rock for like 300 bucks. It is yeah. way cheaper per acre. Um, or per square foot, whatever you're doing. Perfect, yeah. um, so uh, that would that, but biochar, it, the other bit of it is I did a six acre biochar um, uh, grow with hemp in Colorado and we charged it with waste from aquaponics and um, the biochar region, the plants are a little bit bigger, probably from the extra nitrogen, but we had no real yield difference after year two. Um, once that nitrogen was gone, and, uh, and, and this was in Gilcrest, Colorado. So take mm -hmm. from that what you will. But we did a 1%, 3%, and 5% on half acre with a half acre control and then two acres where we were doing um, a different test. Um, and <laughs> the biochar after year two had no difference in, in yield or anything like that. Um, biochar is great if you have sand, gravel, really crappy soil. But if you already have good soil, Biochar isn't going to have that much of an impact in terms of yield, um, you know, because you already have most of those uh, microbial spaces covered. So um, you want, it can be a great tool if you need it and you have really poor soil. If I was growing in an area that was, you know, San Diego County or someplace like that, yeah, yeah. it's going to definitely make a difference. But um, you know, other, if you already have great soil, you know, focus on IMOs or some of the other stuff. That's going to have a much larger instant impact on your garden than. Uh, you know, just trying to add biochar every year, like some people try to preach. See, I, I disagree, sort of. I think if you have really good soil, it probably won't matter enough that, that if you didn't do it, you'll miss out on it. But I've seen way too many things that have changed using it over the years. And I think it is something that, you know, year two and the conditions you're in. And like my thing is the control was the control getting bathed in uh a uh, Steven Reisner IMO and stuff like that, where you like, or was it just, you know, straight, commercial grow because that's that's also a different thing in of itself but what biochar does really good to me are two things one it holds on so my philosophy on fertility is build increase hold 
And so it helps hold. But my other thing is, are you irrigating? If you're irrigating at all, having something in your soil that holds seven and a half times its weight in water is probably a good idea. If you're not irrigating and you're not, you know, you're not on any intensive inputs and you are having great results, I wouldn't do anything because why would you? And then my other side of that is like, we use it because by putting it in the bird's feed, it increases their feed utilization by 20%. So we spend 20% less on feed or feed them 20% less. Uh, It immediately begins to be charged up in their excrement. So it ends up like, it's just part of the whole process. And I think that one trial, like doesn't really tell you anything, especially in one situation for one type of plant. So hemp has its requirements. I think you guys probably have that really dialed in already. So if you're in a polyculture situation and you're bringing in all this diversity, I think it's a totally different situation. I am with you. It will do more in a sandy soil than a clay soil. Absolutely. Because the clay already has significant water holding capacity. And if we use biology to get our tilth up and get aggregation going and all, it's going to only have so much effect. But I've looked at way too many studies um, with dramatic differences for one that didn't have it to change my opinion. Sure. Uh, just that was the results from our one study. That's I got you. Uh, and I, I get that. I mean, the other thing that I got out of biochar that I never thought I would, and I honestly thought the person telling me was lying, was that we had, and you saw it, we had this year, eggplants and peppers that survived two days of sub 30 degree temperature and didn't die. They didn't. And I don't know when, because we killed them because we cover crop that, that place, but I don't know what it would have took to kill them. I'm sure if it was a couple more degrees, it would have killed them, but extending a plant's ability to live into, you know, moderate frost, that's an annual, that's pretty, and that's the only, that's the only change between previous seasons and this year for those plants in that spot. So I think it all depends. Um, a great, a great way, just to add to that, a great way, if you want to increase the temperature resilience of your crops, yeah. get aquaponics or soil, uh, increasing your silica levels is going to be the number mm-hmm. one thing. We've noticed with aquaponics, with swin switching to potassium silicate with a pH up, that the plants are much more resilient, uh, but the, the lettuce doesn't bolt as much in the heat. Uh, it takes cool. a lot hotter temperatures uh, uh, to get that lettuce and leafy greens to bolt. Um, but also when it gets cold, the plants are more frost resistant as well. It's been a, a pretty pretty noticeable difference. I wonder if that would help with cilantro bolting because cilantro bolts, you look at it and it bolts. Um, the only thing is I don't really want my pH to go up at all. I mean, like, um, you know, my my water out of the ground is like 8.2. You know, so it's because it's in limestone. It's literally in a limestone cavern. What you know? What do you expect? Be be careful with cilantro in North America for outdoor aquaponics gardens specifically because the uh, water lily aphid, which is a close relative of the rice root aphid, loves cilantro above really? all other things. So it will attract ra- flying the flying stage rice root aphids. I know in Oklahoma, I've seen it three times where people were growing cilantro, and it just it's like a magnet for them. So. Uh, huh. depending on what time of year you know, planted it at the cooler times of year, do not plant that in July or August. Cause you will get them. I wouldn't bother anyway. It just, it, cause it just dies. It, well, it doesn't die. It, it like the plants this big and it sends up a center stock and starts to bolt on you. The best cilantro I ever grew, uh, was volunteer. And I, I, it took like, I mowed the lawn twice going, what does that smell before I stopped mowing that area? And it was like an area by my back fence uh, of the previous property I owned. And I guess some of the seed from some of it that did make it to, to that stage ended up down there. And you, you're mowing the grass and you're like, I I, I know that smell and I kind of like it. But I, it took me a while to figure it out because you just don't expect cilantro to grow in the middle of your lawn. But uh, that was the best. I, and I I think there's a place for that, too, with with like permaculture properties, like spread seed around once in a while. It's not that expensive, especially if you're saving it. And if it if it tells you I like it here, then don't fight the system, man. Roll with it. Um, my last one I have for you is how long can you keep labs in the fridge? And for those that may be tuned in late and think we're talking about testing, we're talking about lactoacid bacteria. So you can keep it in the fridge for four or five days. Um, what I usually do is just restart the cycle. So I'll just take the labs from before, plop it in a little bit of milk and just let it, you know, one of the little jugs of milk and then just let it you know, re- continue to populate. It'll keep populating in the fridge. It just goes much slower because the temperature. So okay. you can kind of slow it down 
when you're not using it and just keep an active culture. Just, you know, set a calendar every couple of days to, to, you know, pour it into the next batch of milk so that you keep it going. Um, that That's kind of the easiest way. Or, the, you know, traditional KNF, they say you can cut it 50% with sugar. To me, it works so much better when it's fresh. Um, the other bit of it is that vitamin B that it's producing is not going to be as stable long term if you cut it with sugar. So, you know, if you're going to get the most out of it, um, it's one of the other benefits of lactobacillus is all the different complexes of vitamin B, which acts as growth accelerators. Um, so that's like the other reason why you want to keep it fresh. So to me, it's, you know, you can go buy kefir at the store and grab some milk on the way home. And, you know, you're, you're off to the races every time you go to the grocery store, you, even if you only want to make it, you know, a couple of days before you do it, you don't need to necessarily have to keep it on hand. I like to keep a diverse uh, range of different kefirs and stuff like that into one little mother culture that I then just kind of reuse like you would for vinegar or for, you know, kombucha or whatever, but you don't have to do that. To me, it just works a little bit better and a little more diverse, but that's, I'm just particularly prickly about my stuff. So um, you can do it just fine. If you pick up a, you know, the, the, the yogurt that's on manager's special that's unflavored at the grocery store and a thing of milk on the way home and you'll be just fine. Yeah. There was well, one other good question. A bottle Somebody... of capsules with the stuff, right? Like that works. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, you anyway, can get the probiotics. Bad. Yep, those yeah. probiotics at the, at the the pharmacy. They have them in a little fridge. You just ask them for them. Crack those capsules open. That's another great way. You know, a lot of people are in the city. You, know, you can't sit out and air collect the lactobacillus in your ice wash if you want to because of the pollution or whatever else. You can just use that, you know, if you're in a more urban environment. Um, somebody else asked about spirulina. I did want to just touch on that because I have a lot okay, of cool. experience with it. Um, uh, when I was in Jamaica, we were raising spirulina as our main feed. So we were taking spirulina and mango roaches, which are basically like giant hissing cockroaches, um, drying the spirulina, uh, drying out the roaches, grinding them together into a powder. And that was our, our main pelletized feed that we were generating on the farm in Jamaica. Um, cool. You know, that was the so that it absolutely can be a great feed um and then someone else mentioned about the super labs you can take one pound of spirulina a quarter pound of kelp uh and then add that to your lactobacillus um same same recipe we talked about earlier with lactobacillus uh for a four gallon batch and uh, that will create um uh, isolates the phycocyanin which is your main building block for your chlorophyll a through e uh, in plants, right? It's the most energy intensive compound they have to make. The plants will readily uptake it both foliarly and through the root zone. So it acts as an amazing growth accelerator or a, oh crap, my plant's like half dead because I went away for a weekend and now it's covered in aphids. Um, and you're trying to like revive this zombie plant. You can take the, the layer. So what you do is separate the curds off of it once it's finished. And right below the curds will be this brilliant blue, neon bright blue layer. Um, like we have in the, in the, the talk I, I gave at Jack's workshop. You can watch the video on, on his channel here um, and you'll have this brilliant blue layer. Now siphon that off with like a turkey baster and use that at a ratio of like one to 20, one to 40 uh, in, in a spray bottle and just give your plants a quick spray. Any of the damaged plants. I had some peppers that hadn't been watered in three weeks that were about this tall. Um, my ex killed them all when I went away. Uh, I came home, poured the super labs on all of them. And I had new leaf branches growing out of every dead leaf node on all of these plants that were bone dry. The leaves were so dry they were paper. The plants were functionally dead. And we were able to revive about 80% of them uh, with this serum. So it works miracles on plants that are really screwed up. You get a hailstorm. You have some other, your know, dog decided to chew the crap out of a plant. This is, that's the kind of stuff that this works really good for kind of immediately getting that plant to bounce back from. Um, or if you just want a regular growth accelerator that's fish safe, you, know, you can put in the system. It's another great way to just, you know, get better production out of your plants without having to do anything that's going to be chemical or, you know, synthetic. Awesome, man. I mean, I conducted this interview and I'm going to listen to it again because <laughs> you just have so much knowledge and information and you've put some of this stuff into some courses, particularly three I have in the show notes uh, with a discount code. So uh, this will be open to everybody for about a week. It'll be in the notes. You can get the code. We're not going to give it out audible because after that week, it's going to move into the MSB only and uh, only MSB members will be able to get it. But you're giving out like 50 bucks off per course, uh, which is a huge discount. If you take one of them, it pays for your MSB for a year right there, folks. You want to tell them about the three courses and kind of what's in each one? Sure. Yeah. So I have um, the Aquaponic Cannabis Masterclass, which is a 
like a five, six day class on, on how to do uh, various things in aquaponic cannabis from start to finish. We cover everything. We assume that you know nothing about aquaponics and that you've never touched a cannabis plant before. So we cover everything from, you know, how to select your right stuff, uh, one that's right for you, why you would want to grow different types, what the different varieties are, how to go about setting the system up to be successful, both commercial and at home scale. Uh, and then all the different licensing that's a bit, you know, you have to go through all the different hard parts you might have to go through. All of that's in there, you know, and adjusted for, you know, both the U.S. and, and international. Um, so we cover all that. We also have different tours of different facilities I've built uh, on there and some behind the scenes footage and demonstrations of a bunch of different things. Tons of reference photos for diseases and pests so you can kind of see what's going on, um, you know, at different weeks uh, of the progression of these different diseases. All different types of um, useful stuff. Dosing guides for nutrients, pesticide releases. Um, uh, for beneficial insects, biocontrol uh, dosages for your biocontrols, um, how to make a lot of the different stuff that we talked about, most of the things that we talked about today, and detailed different volumetric amounts, and all different types of different topics, um, uh, along with my co-host Marty, who's um, been doing it commercially in Oregon for a long time as well. Um, so that's the a uh, APMJclass.com. I also have the PestClass.com, which is uh, my biocontrol and beneficial insect class. So uh, it works equally good for aquaponics and for living soil. Um, the uh, a couple people from the workshop actually uh, uh, got a copy uh, uh, on the uh, barter blanket as a uh, uh, so uh, definitely uh, um, you can ask them if you know any of those people here and uh, personally. But um, uh, so the pest class we cover all the different how to make your own biocontrols. We cover how to collect your own nematodes to get rid of snails and slugs. We we cover like how to. Uh, you know, assume like I have a lot of experience in Africa and Asia and stuff like that, where we couldn't have a any company that I could just go purchase this stuff from. You know, there there is no beneficial insect company in Thailand that you know they just don't they aren't there yet, right? Same thing in, in Zimbabwe. So we had to kind of develop a lot of these methods that you know uh, have to achieve the same results. So that's how we was, we talked about with the IPMO or the integrated the IMO pest control version that we talked about. So um, we kind of cover all that as long as well as. Uh, the beneficial insect release rates and all that kind of stuff so that you know exactly how much to use for your garden. Um, and that's the pestclass.com. And then we have a nutrientclass.com, which is the aquaponic minerals and microbes class that will be released here this spring. Uh, we have uh, uh, the last bit of editing to do, and then that'll be up here in the next few weeks, along with our aquaponic master class, which will be up there as well, um, which is a, a long form, but the longest class I've put together yet, uh, which is going to be uh, close to a thousand slides along with video hands-on and whole bunch of other cool stuff and kind of like all the different weird stuff that we've I've ever done in terms of design and uh, diagrams and how to plumb everything and, and, and all that so that you can kind of pick and choose what you want from it to make your own system, both commercially and home system. So um, those will be the, the different courses that we have available right now. Uh, and you guys can check those out in the links below uh, wherever you're listening to this. Yeah, if you want to get more information on those classes, if you want to get the discount code for them for the next week anyway, if you want any of the stuff that Stephen talked about as far as resources, uh, sites you can go, if you want to connect with Stephen, if you want anything, just go to the survivalpodcast.com, pull up episode 3,443, and I'll give you a little hack. If you put EPI-3443 in the search box, it'll pull that episode up like because it's the only one that'll say that. So uh, always make sure you're using the search feature when you're looking for content on our site. And I've got – I can't forget – because it's all done. And the one he gave me that I didn't have was a true aquaponics store. And I added it while he was talking about it. So it's already there. Uh, this will go up as the audio side about 30 minutes after we finish up. So if you click the link in the video notes for it below, guess what? It won't be there yet because we're not quite done, but we will be soon. Steven, man, thank you for being with us today. You are always just a whirlwind of information uh, and not just like the volume, but the quality of the information. You are truly welcome on my show to talk about any of this stuff, including other things, anytime you want. All you got to do is fill a form out. We'll have you back. Dr. will get you booked. Thank you so much today. You got anything else before we sign off? I really appreciate it. I just want to give a quick shout out. If you guys didn't check out the episode from last month, um, be sure to check out the one where we talked about the uh, Korean natural farming and natural farming AI. Um, you can check that out over at um, copyleftcultivars.com. Uh, we have all the information to that over there. Uh, or uh, if you wanted to uh, instant access on Patreon, uh, just look up Copy Left Cultivars if you want to find out more and get instant access to the AI. We're getting close to the release of the 2.0 version. Um, we have it uh, 
where it's on parity, we're just adding some additional functionality before we'll be releasing the next version. So, um, you know, definitely check that out and check out that episode if you haven't already. We we go through in depth on a lot of natural farming stuff. So I'm gonna just for people listening, let you know. I one thing I didn't have in the show notes, I will add that. But the episode you are looking for, if you want to know more about the AI tool, which I had Stephen on a couple of weeks ago about, which is just flipping awesome, is episode 3431. And Stephen's actually been on the show um, three times now. This is his third time on the show. And previous to that, he was on for episode 3115. I've actually added a Stephen Reisner tag uh, to the blog tagging mechanism. So if you find any of his episodes and click on the tag in the bottom, it'll pull up everything that he's ever been on. And we'll keep adding that tag whenever we have him back on. Steve, again, man, thank you. Yep, thank you. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that one. Steve really is, you know, there's not a lot of times I bring people on and intellectually I'm challenged. He's one of them. I mean, I'll just say it like it's it's like, what did you just say? It's it's amazing. So uh, definitely check out his other stuff. Uh, I will tell you the cannabis course, even if you're not interested in cannabis, you will learn so much about aquaponics. It might be worth doing. Uh, definitely the nutrient course and the, you know, the, the pest course. All of those are awesome. 50 bucks a piece. If you were to take them all over time, it would cover your MSP for three years just from one supporting vendor. So that'd be awesome. But right now, it doesn't matter where your MSB or not, you can get the discount code. Just pull up today's episode and it'll be there till this day next week when I will take it away and it will be MSB only. Uh, <laughs> I love that comment. Uh, Sma says it's uh, like watching Jesus talk about the birds and the bees. That's just great. Anyway, real quick, if you'd like this show and the work that we do and you want to help support us, remember, Member Support Brigade is the number one way I pay the bills around here. You know, everything else is some little money here and there, but uh, MSB, you get discounts to all kinds of stuff that more than cover the cost of your membership. It is stupid cheap at 50 bucks a year. You can learn more at the survivalpodcast.com forward slash members. And you really are like, this is not, and you know, uh, PBS or whatever, like you're keeping us on the air by giving us money for free. We'll take a hundred bucks from you and give you a 50 cent coffee mug. It's not that we give you value back, but it is what keeps us on the air. It's how I've been able to do this show almost 16 years now without it. I wouldn't be able to pay my mortgage, let alone keep the show on the air. So thank you to all who have supported me with the MSB. And if you are not an MSB member yet, please consider becoming one because you are you know, kind of in the family, so to speak, at that point. Uh, the other ways to do your online shopping at tspaz.com. That's T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. This is a, a, a very inexpensive and like no real cost, painless way to support the work we do. And that's just whenever you're going to shop online, start your shopping at tspaz.com. And when you're there, you can find all my reviews category, categorized alphabetically. We put out an item of the day almost every day, Not, every, but most days we put one out. Today, you know, we are heading into spring. It's February, what, 7th today? Uh, but it's beautiful outside and the trees are starting to bud. And now is the time to get your you know, bushes, your vines, your trees. If you haven't pruned yet, you need to do it. To me, I'm a big believer in tools. You buy a thing that you can leave behind and your kid can use it. That's that's what I'm looking for out of my tools. It's not always possible, but if it is, that's what I'm looking for. When it comes to pruners, Felco and Felco and Felco. Like Corona's next level, you know, like the lower level down, but it's so far down, Felco and then Felco and then Felco. Uh, the Felco F2, if you talk to professional nurserymen that they prune trees every day, that's what they use. That's what all of them use. Just like I told you, the Victor Knox semi-stiff boning life is what all the meat cutters use. This is that for pruning. Uh, they are on sale today at 22% off. And at the cost of them, it's a good time to buy. My write-up on them today is pretty extensive, including how to sharpen them, including a video of how to sharpen them. And if you really just can't bear to part with the money for the Felco F2s, I have two other Corona options that are pretty good. Uh, that you could step down to, and one will cut the bill about in half for you if you really have to. The other thing I have is some information on the F6 pruners, also by Felco, which are just a little bit smaller. I've heard from people, uh, smaller-handed people, especially females, that say the F2 pruners are just a little bit big for their hand. The F2 is, or the F6 is basically the same pruner scaled down a little bit. Just know this. If you scale down a pruner, you scale down the length of your handles, you scale down your leverage, it's a little bit harder to cut through some of your larger stock. But 
what I say is if you want at least step up to those Coronas, buy the discount bargain bin ones at Home Depot or Lowe's and expect to throw them away every year. Because once you go below that level of quality, it just to me isn't really – I wouldn't recommend you spend your money that way, as, as I'll say. So if you're going to do it, spend as little as possible. Uh, but remember, you can find everything that I recommend at tspaz.com when you're doing your online shopping. And if I haven't bought it, used it, tested it, it doesn't go there. If I wouldn't buy it again, it doesn't go there. When I find a better product, I don't take the old review away, but I put a big disclaimer on the top that says, I now recommend this product because it's better. And I've been doing that now for about seven years, I think I've been running tspaz. I don't get any complaints about my product recommendations, and there's a reason. So definitely check out tspaz.com if you never have before. Thank you for tuning in today. Thank you to our special guest, Stephen Reisner. Definitely check out his courses. And I'll tell you, man, you guys that struggle with insects, check out the pest control one. It's not that expensive with the discount. It's a hell of a bargain. Take care, guys, and I will catch you. Uh, well, next live stream will be Monday. Tomorrow will be expert council Q&A. Assuming I have enough content from the Piking Council over here, and, uh, you know, Fridays are flashbacks. So catch you again on a live stream Monday next week.